councillors welcome. Welcome, uh, could you please stand? Almighty God, we the representatives of the citizens of the city of Brisbane are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open and I remind all councillors of your obligations to declare material, personal and conflicts of interest where relevant and requirement of such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable councillors. Are there any apologies? Yes, Chair. My uh, Councillor Cassidy. I uh, just uh, wish to advise a councillor uh, Cook will not be joining the meeting today and um, move that she be granted a leave of absence. Second. Is the Charles Strunk, Councillor Strunk? Yes, second. Yep. So I have, uh, is that all? Uh, I have an apology uh, for Councillor Cook. It's been moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Strunk, that Councillor Cook be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour say aye and raise your hand, please. Aye. aye. Thank you. And the noes, please raise your hand. The ayes have it. Councillors, you may recall uh, some weeks ago we had an unwell public participant uh, the good news is uh, Mr. Poxon has recovered and he will be uh, presenting his, um, providing his presentation to us today. Mr. Poxon, please enter the room or please have him admitted to the room. Actually, excuse me, councillors, I've made a minor error. Uh, could I please have a confirmation of minutes? Mr. Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,619th meeting held on Tuesday, 2nd June 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. I second that. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the minutes of the 4,619th meeting of Council held on the 2nd of June 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye and raise your hands, please. Aye. And those against, no, and raise your hands. Thank you. The ayes have it. Uh, welcome, Mr. Poxon. Uh, you, you are here to address us um, about an advocacy to increase the job seeker payment. Um, please proceed, Mr. Poxon. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair, Lord Mayor, and, and fellow councillors, uh, for your time. My name is Jeremy Poxon. I'm a representative with the Australian Unemployed. Uh, Workers' Union, um, which is a national organisation with branches um, throughout throughout the country, um, including here in Brisbane, made up of social security recipients, made up on people on the job seeker payment, essentially campaigning and advocating uh, for better conditions uh, for all unemployed workers. I'm also a local local resident. Uh, I live in I live in Norman Park. I'm currently on the job seeker entitlement, um, and I'm one of many thousands, tens of thousands um, of Brisbane residents extremely worried about what's going to happen uh, to us and to our town and to our economy uh, when the federal government decides uh, to remove the current temporary uh, COVID supplement uh, from the job seeker payment on September 24th. As part of the Raise the Rate uh, campaign, um, the AEW alongside ACOS, um, alongside the Anti-Poverty Network, as, as you may have heard, have been lobbying local councils across this country to start advocating for a permanent raise to what used to be called New Start, but is now called the Job Seeker Payment. Uh, this campaign has been an incredible success um, to date. We've gotten 47 local councils um, across the country to pass motions to start publicly advocating for a permanent and much needed raise to the Job Seeker Entitlement. You might remember advocates from the Anti-Poverty Network in 2018 successfully got the local the local Logan City Council to start publicly advocating for a permanent raise to New Start to the Henderson Poverty Line. This is something I'm calling on uh, Brisbane City Council to do uh, today as soon as possible, to put up a motion to start publicly advocating for all the residents here um, who are subsisting on the job seeker payment, who are terrified about what's going to happen if and when the federal government dump us all back on $40 a day. Because we know uh, what's going to happen um, when the government chooses to do that. I won't bore you with all the stats um, and, and the details, but we know just how criminally low uh, the, the old rate of New Start 
was the rate that the government wants to put us back on um, in a few short months. According to data from ACOS, we know that 84% of us on the job seeker payment were regularly skipping meals in order to survive. Um, we know that 66% um, of job seeker payment recipients couldn't afford to put heating on um, in winter. We know that more than half of job seeker payment recipients only had $100 to spend after their housing, as, uh, after their housing costs. Uh, we know that Brisbane particularly is a hard city uh, for people like myself, for people in the job seeker payment to live. According to the uh, most recent Anglicare um, snapshot for rental affordability, it basically found zero, I repeat, zero affordable rental properties for a single person like myself on New Start. So we're really appreciative uh, that the government has temporarily doubled. Uh, the doll, and we think that's shown um, how easy it is for them to continue this permanently. And that's something else I'm calling on council to think about and do whatever they can um, to support. Because I really want to bring your attention that we're we're in for a real cataclysm and real poverty crisis once the government strips this supplement away on September 24th. There are estimates that there are going to be 1.7 million people in this country still on still on the job seeker payment, still unemployed at that point. So we're looking on September 24th as the single biggest dumping of Australians in poverty um, in our history. We're looking on September 24th of the biggest dumping of Brisbane residents in poverty in our, in our city's history. We're talking about tens of thousands of people needlessly dumped into poverty on that date. This is why local council, businesses, all of us advocates need to, need to come together and do everything we can to stop this from happening. This is a big crisis. This is a big moment for us to do whatever we can to protect the health and, and well-being um, of, of Brisbane residents and do everything in our power to, to stop this from, from happening. I will mention that I've previously approached uh, the Lord Mayor um, on, on this issue. He was supportive, but ultimately he, he told me that that the level of New Start is outside of council's jurisdiction and directed me on to the federal minister, Anne Rustin. I sort of want to put a pin um, in, in, in that idea and make the, make the case really clear that, that, that this is an issue uh, for, for, for local council. I'm hoping that given we are in the worst unemployment crisis we've seen in, in, in 90 years, um, that local council will take a more hands-on approach um, with, with this issue. Job seekers are really scared about what's going to happen to them after September 24th. They're contacting the union, ex extremely worried. They're already planning to, to skip meals and try and save as much of the supplement as they can going forward. And, and it's really time for... Sorry. Mr. Poxon, your time's expired. Thank you. For thank, that. thank you for your time. Uh, your, you, there was a response, I believe, coming from Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to Mr. Poxon for uh, coming in and presenting to Council today. Um, you know, certainly this is a, a topic that you feel strongly about and uh, in the current environment, certainly a greater number of people are either going to be unemployed or may experience unemployment and uh, we're conscious of the increasing level of unemployment in Brisbane as it is right across the country. So it is not something that um, we are um, unsympathetic to and we do really um, appreciate that the uh, the pressure is out there. And uh, you, you made a, a point uh, in your comments there that um, you know, council needed to take a hands-on approach. And that's certainly something that we have done. In recent months, we've um, responded to the uh, financial pain that the residential and commercial community in Brisbane is feeling and have made uh, undertaken certain initiatives to, uh, to minimise the, the pressure on them. And we will continue to take on a role of providing targeted support um, for the community in Brisbane. Um, I note the points you raised that um, clearly the uh, job seeker fortnightly payment is pitched at around $1,115. And obviously that includes a component um, for the coronavirus supplement, which as you've indicated will at this point um, be removed on the 24th of September. And uh, I'd further note, I guess, that the provision of childcare support, income support, Medicare, et cetera, is wholly within the remit of the federal government uh, through Services Australia. And uh, as the responsibility of the, the federal government um, is in this domain, my recommendation will continue to be that um, 
you pursue your objectives through the federal government and through your local federal member of parliament. From a council perspective, we are very focused on people retaining employment and creating an environment where people can seek and secure employment. You know, this is a, uh, a role that's sort of relevant to council, both as an organisation, so we're keen to ensure that our staff uh, re retain employment, um, that we deal with our stakeholders, staff and registered unions and the wider community to support employment outcomes in Brisbane. So the, the opportunity to create an environment where people can secure and retain employment uh, is seen by us as our key priority. And uh, we will continue to pursue uh, initiatives that will support the job market in, uh, in Brisbane. And accordingly, our engagement and advocacy with the federal government will focus on job creation and encouraging the federal government to deploy funds into job creating projects. And at the moment, council is currently engaged in negotiations with the federal government to fast track a number of projects here in Brisbane. And once again, they're focused on driving job outcomes. And uh, I guess the view is that we have a view that um, the best form of support is a job. However, we do acknowledge that circumstances arise where people um, don't have a job and they need support. And uh, we see obviously job seeker payments as part of the role of helping period uh, people through a period of unemployment uh, and ultimately back into the, uh, the workforce. But we do acknowledge that the level of job seeker payments are solely at the discretion of the federal government. They have much better visibility to the uh, position of their own budget and any constraints that might exist there and they also have a better sense of where their priorities lie. And as you'd appreciate it, in these unprecedented times, it's incredibly difficult to know uh, where to direct funding. Um, I think in this particular instance, the federal government continues to have this under close scrutiny. I think it's too early to tell just exactly what they might do come the end of September. But once again, that's very much a, uh, a decision for them. So. From a council perspective, our primary responsibility is to uh, the, the residents of Brisbane, um, that they expect us to continue to provide services and um, you know, picking up rubbish, smoother suburban streets, getting on with infrastructure projects such as Brisbane Metro, and that will remain a key focus for us. And certainly um, we will continue to um, provide support to the residents of Brisbane uh, within the council remit um, however, the provision of uh, income support payments or even uh, support for an increase is outside of our remit or plan. Um, as you may be aware, the Lord Mayor will hand down the, uh, the council budget on the 17th of June, next Wednesday, and uh, hopefully we will have further announcements to make in that budget that will help support the residents of Brisbane. And thank you again, Mr Poxon, for coming in and presenting to council today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Poxon. Thank you. Um, councillors, uh, I will now draw your attention to uh, question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or any standing committees? Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, over the weekend, the Schrinner administration announced the next stage of construction of the Brisbane Metro will soon be underway. Can you explain these exciting next steps on a vital project for our city? The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Mackay, for the question. Uh, and it was a very exciting day uh, on Sunday to confirm that we've got the green light for major construction on Brisbane Metro. We've got the green light to create 2,600 jobs, and we've got the green light to deliver Brisbane's first turn up and go mass transit system, Brisbane Metro. Uh, so we are absolutely committed to progressing this project. Uh, we have jumped through every hurdle. Uh, we have confronted every obstacle. Uh, we have uh, taken on the challenge of Brisbane what? Metro because we are committed to this project. Brisbane deserves better public transport. Brisbane deserves a turn up and go mass transit system. And that is exactly uh, what they will be getting with Brisbane Metro. Uh, just uh, last week, I confirmed that 
uh, the council procurement team had shortlisted uh, the three major construction tenders down to one consortium, uh, Brisbane Move, which is made up of Axiona and Arup. Uh, and it was great to be there on the weekend to confirm uh, now that we've got state government agreement uh, on a key sticking point in the Brisbane Metro project. It was uh, this time last year, in June last year, uh, that uh, the state government asked us to go back to the drawing board and redesign the cultural centre station. Uh, they asked us to look at underground options at the convention centre and modified underground options at the cultural centre. And uh, we have been doing that work. Uh, and in all that work that's happened, uh, we've had almost 12 months of delay. For a major part of the project, there's been uh, money and time expended, uh, but what's important now is that we have reached a sensible outcome to progress the project. We've reached a sensible outcome uh, to get on with creating those jobs. Last year, we uh, awarded the contract for the construction of the Metro vehicles. Uh, and in fact, the, the first pilot vehicle uh, to come out here for testing through the company Hess, uh, which uh, is under construction at the moment. We're looking forward to it arriving in Brisbane. But that part of the project uh, was a great outcome for Metro because it will deliver um, a fully electric, the first of its kind in Australia, uh, Metro vehicle that will quickly and efficiently move large numbers of people and provide a frequency of service uh, which Brisbane has not ever experienced. Uh, and now with major construction uh, going ahead um, on other parts of the project, including the Adelaide Street Tunnel, uh, the conversion of Victoria Bridge to a green bridge, um, the improvement of not only public transport, but also pedestrian and cycling facilities uh, and upgrades across uh, the, the network that this will make possible. Uh, we are really excited now to be getting on with it. I have to particularly commend uh, Minister Mark Bailey for the way in which he has oh. uh, been dealing with us in recent weeks. Uh, we have been able to achieve more progress in the last few weeks than we have in 18 months uh, of dealing with the state government. We know that uh, there's been much publicised. There have been over 200 meetings that have been held with the state government, but Yet, in the matter of two or three meetings in recent times, uh, we have been able to get positive agreement and map out a way forward. And we are doing that with uh, the decision on the Cultural Centre Station. What is being proposed today uh, through the uh, special ENC submission is an amendment to the significant contracting plan, which will see upgrades occur to the above ground station at the Cultural Centre. Uh, and the deferral of the underground station to a later date. This is something that the state government agrees with. This is something that the minister agrees with uh, and something that we have also talked to uh, the local state member on as well. And so we're moving forward, we're creating jobs and making sure that Brisbane Metro can be delivered as soon as possible for the residents of Brisbane. Now we know that the challenges that uh, Brisbane is faced when it comes to a public transport system uh, are that there are uh, key bottlenecks in the system that need to be unlocked. And by upgrading the cultural centre station, we are upgrading the busiest station in the Queensland public transport network. And the upgrade that will occur to the above ground station, uh, once it's completed... Lord, uh, Mayor, we'll... Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Are there any further questions? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Um, my question is to uh, Councillor Marks. For many years, you have, you have promoted Brisbane as a clean, green and sustainable city. You proudly boast that Brisbane possesses a green canopy that is the envy of many cities. On the 12th of May, in a reply to a question from Councillor Cummings on the removal of two mature gum trees from Rotary Park, Callendale, you said that the trees had to be removed because the subsurface root system would be compromised as a consequence of excavation work to install a playground and seating. Councillor Marks, 
What you may not have been told was that the excavation work for the playground, including two rows of seating, had already taken place without impact on the root system. It wasn't until stage two, when a third row of seating was added, that the trees were removed. Additionally, the file made recently available shows no arborist report or consultation in support of the removal of the trees. Council Marks, will you undertake to investigate the removal of these two mature, healthy gum trees from Rotary Park Heathwood and explain why the extra seating was more important than the mature gum trees that were that provided the only shade for this playground? Oh, thank you, um, Chair, Council and Mark. thank you. No, Councillor Marks, please you come back on to your turn your video back on, please. Hang on. Sorry, my video is playing up. I push it and, and it disappears. That's right. It, it my just... apologies. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I thank Councillor Strunk for the question. Um, so he mentioned the trees that were in Heath uh, Rotary Park in Heathwood. Um, and as I mentioned previously when this question was asked three, four chambers ago, I wasn't the chair at the time, but I was more than happy to investigate, and um, the investigation was undertaken. And we talked about this um, one or two chambers ago and we talked about how the project was entirely funded by the Ward Park Trust Fund in two parts. Um, and stage one, which was the initial project scope, was to install a new program with rubber undersurfacing, create a dollar. Um, and the, um, there was also a removal, included the removal of eight hoop pine trees and one large iron bark. There was also a small jacaranda growing at the base of one of the other trees that was also removed. Um, this tree was not identified, um, but it was removed as part of that project. Now, stage two was a further allocation was submitted to establish a multi-level terrace surrounding the playground with sandstone blocks and other works. And that was when the removal of the two eucalyptus trees um, was slated to occur. And as we also mentioned at the time, offset planting did take place at the time. So, and that project was funded, um, as we said at the time, by two different um, projects. One was the Ward Park Trust Fund. Um, and it said here, what the information I've got is exactly what I've just said. Stage one was eight hoop pines, one large iron bark and one small jacaranda. And stage two was the two eucalyptus. Um, and as I said, they were um, 27 45 litre trees planted and maintained as, an, as a, the offset of those removals. So the information hasn't changed since you last asked the question. The arborist further, further questions? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, Brisbane City Council heard from the Local Government Minister just last week that Brisbane will receive just $5 million in funding from a pot of $200 million for the COVID Works for Queensland program. Can you update the Chamber on this outrageous disregard of Brisbane residents in terms of economic recovery for our city? Are you aware of how this compares to the amounts received by other local governments? Now Jeffrey you know what it feels like. Please, please cease interjecting. Uh, Councillor uh, Adams, please answer the question. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Hammond, for the question. As uh, Chair of Economic Development, the, what we have seen happen over the last few days from the state government is nothing less than absolutely appalling. But let's just get it right from the outset as well, though. I do want to congratulate the state Labor government for their consistency. Every election cycle, they always find some new way to prop up vulnerable MPs and their candidates. Allocating money for political advancement is as strong as ever. Point of order. Of all, Bushland money. Order, point of order. <laughs> okay, Councillor Johnston. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Adams is imputing motive, um, and that is disorderly under Section 21 of the meeting's local law. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, um, as, uh, as Councillor Adams know, well knows, no one here is allowed to impute motive, and I encourage her that if she is doing so, uh, to not do so anymore. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. I was talking about the actions of the state government. 
Um, what I was saying is that what we see under the veil of the COVID to prop up councils' cash injections, what we actually have is a program to get themselves re-elected in seats where they need it most. Oh, yeah. And they Great. announced it as the Great. states work <laughs> <in> order. <laughs> is this a comedy? <laughs> I understand that Councillor Adams was a PE teacher, not an English teacher. Okay, no, no. Oh, excuse no, me. Make your point. No, 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 cheap shots. No, cheap shots. No, do not speak while I'm speaking, speaking. Councillor Johnston. Please do not speak while I'm speaking. Um, I ask, I direct you and I ask all councillors to refrain from taking cheap shots at each other. Okay? All right? Make your point of order. Don't take any cheap shots. Be quick about it. Councillor Johnston. Councillor Adams is defying your ruling. Um, 21, one says you, uh, 21 says you cannot impute motive. Councillor Adams is doing that when she says why the state government is allegedly putting this money in the way that it is, and that is disorderly, Mr Chairman. You say section 21, one of the meeting's local law? Twenty-one, one, six. Well, that's actually really quite specific and doesn't actually define or include the things you're talking about. However, I will... Point of order, Mr Chairman. It no, says no, 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 Councillor Johnston. The motive not going to, no, the you don't speak while I'm speaking. Don't argue with me, please. You've asked for a ruling and a ruling doesn't involve... A discussion or debate between you and I about it, okay? It, it just doesn't. And um, you've asked whether under 21.1c, Councillor Adams was impugning motive. Now, the section for all councillors says a councillor commits an act of disorder at a meeting of council or a committee if the councillor makes a statement reflecting adversely on the character or motives of a councillor, a council officer a member of the public or any committee of council. Now, in my strict reading of that, Councillor Adams actually hasn't done what you've said. However, I will ask her to refrain from imputing motive generally. Okay, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I'm very clear here that the question was, uh, what do I believe about the $5 million funding that Brisbane got, just 2.5% of the entire bucket that the state received? And I think Councillor Johnson made it very clear. What I alleged, did not accuse, what I allege, and I will continue my answer, regard, disregarding the rudeness we see from the other side of the chamber. This was a program that was designed to get Queenslanders back to work bring forward infrastructure jobs, naturally, I would think, in cities with the most unemployment. Right? Wrong. That is not what we have seen the state Labor government do. This initiative was about to be about job creation, not their job creation, not their own jobs, the jobs of the unemployed in Queensland. Brisbane's unemployment figure predicted to this June quarter is 135,000 people. And we get the equivalent of $4 per person. That's less than a cup of coffee. We have higher unemployment employment in Brisbane than many regional councillors have population. But Councillor Cassidy said this morning on ABC that there could be an argument that we maybe we need more funding, but, you know, it's probably enough. Well, that's how the ALP on that side of the chamber support Brisbane residents. Go and explain that to the guest speaker that we just had, Councillor Cassidy, when we're being offered money, but only 2.5% of an entire pot in the state's capital. But we do know, Councillor Cassidy, obviously, don't fight too hard for your residents lest you contradict Minister Hinchcliffe. Can but I, it does I, beg uh, the question... Can, can, Councillor Adams, can I please ask you uh, that you uh, direct all comments through the chair and that uh, references to other councillors be made in the third person, please? Point of order, Thank Chair. you, Mr Chair, of course. I'm sorry. Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Well, um, Councillor Adams is clearly imputing motive on me now, so I think 211C does apply in this case. Uh, no, I appreciate the point you're making. As I've said, the direction I issued earlier 
stands. Uh, I'll issue it again. Uh, please resist from imputing motive. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. We do know that they are protest so much they don't like what they're hearing and because we don't like what we're seeing. It's an absolute outrage. And I agree with Councillor Cassie. It's an outrage. And he should be doing more, but he's not. He is not doing more. It turns out what we see from the state government is that there definitely wasn't an economic rationale in this. And that cannot be disputed. If this was about getting unemployed back to work, it cannot be said that an economic rationale was used. South East Queensland councils have 70% of the population. They only got 25% of the funding. And Brisbane, as I've said, only got 2.5% of that funding as well from a cash for work for Queensland. But what is interesting is the breakdown of funding between councils across the state and maybe the rationale that may have been used through you, Mr Chair, with the state MPs in that area. In Cairns Regional Council, a seat of Cairns held by Labor, but only 3.4% got $7.4 million. Fraser Coast Council, a seat of Meribah held by Labor, only 2.5% got $9 million. Mackay Regional Council, the seat of Whitsunday is held by an independent with 0.7% and a known Labor gain. They want to get that $6.9 million. Order, Mr. And of Chief course... Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. I'm not imputing motive. Sorry. Now, please turn your microphone on, Councillor Johnston. I understand that Councillor Adams wants to keep doing this, but again, she's imputing motive against members of the Labor Party are members of the public, Mr Chairman, and you might not like them, you might not like what they do, you I might not agree with hey, them. Hey, Councillor Johnston, now you, you are now motive. imputing motive on me. That's exactly what you just did just now, and I, I hope. Um, and I won't have that. Hurt. No, 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 no. Um, I have, as you well know, a more generous interpretation of the rules to allow people to make statements. You have now, you have now impugned motive on me, and that is not acceptable. I direct you to never do so again, please. Uh, Point of order, Mr. Chairman. No, I'm not. I'm not finished. I'm not finished. Uh, Councillor Adams was making a point that I don't believe um, uh, was necessarily opinion. She was comparing margins to uh, financial support, which I don't believe falls into the category uh, the, of opinion, which is what you were talking about. And I'll allow it to continue. Motive, imputing motive. She can offer any opinion she wants, Mr Chairman, but mm -hmm. 21 c Thank is you. where yeah. she says the reason it's happening is because Labor wants to win a seat. That is imputing motive. Councillor Johnson, I don't know if you recall, only moments ago we had a discussion where I said that um, points of order raised by you weren't opportunities for you and I to have a discussion or debate about particular things. Um, I appreciate that you don't always uh, listen to what I say or accept what I say. Thank that's you, Mr. that's um, That is uh, part of life. But I would ask that when I say in the future, please don't debate me that I do actually mean that, and please don't debate me uh, on uh, during discussions about points of order, which won't occur. Uh, I will make a ruling and we'll move on, okay? Councillor Adams, please continue. Thank you, Mr Chair. Oh, is there a point of order? Sorry. Uh, point of order, I don't see a point of order. Uh, yes, yeah, point oh, of sorry, order, order Lord Mayor. Look, uh, I might just suggest that um, it might be worth getting a legal interpretation of this issue about motive that we've been talking about because um, it'd be good to have it cleared up for all councillors. Uh, if you're going to use the Councillor Johnston definition, then every single question, asking question time, is impugning motive. I'm, I'm, like every I'm single gonna question. Have, I'm going to have to stop you there because I feel that if we go down this path, we are going to have a discussion about this rather than question time. And I, I'm, I'm just going to have to uh, I accept the premise of what you're saying. I will seek further advice but I must insist um, that if we keep going like this, this will be a discussion about the nature of points of order rather than question time. And I've been arguing with some councillors that we shouldn't be doing that. We should be asking questions and having them answered. Okay, that's what we're, that, all right, that's what we're gonna try and do. Um, but however, I will seek an opinion through the city legal officer. 
Okay. Uh, Councillor Adams, please Can continue. Can I just check, uh, Mr Chair, I've got a minute left. 45 seconds. 45 seconds. Thank you very much. I'll continue repeating the very clear statistics that I was reading out before I was interrupted. Townsville City Council, two seats with margins less than 1.2% for Labor. They got funded more than any other council in Queensland at $13.5 million. They are the facts. What I ask is what rationale was used because it was not the economic rationale needed for the councils with the highest unemployment across the state. What it shows that only people who are worthy of economic stimulus are those that are living in marginal seats. There is a direct correlation that has been shown. Today, Deputy we are Matthew calling on the Premier to allocate by. fairly. Are there further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Chair. Uh, my question is to the Chair of the Finance Administration and Small Business Committee, Councillor Allen. Councillor, much is made by this LMP administration of the $20 million it receives in dividends each year from the City of Brisbane Investment Corporation. However, this council doesn't tell ratepayers that in the 2018-19 financial year, it directly paid the CBIC $15.5 million in rent with a further $6.1 million in rent paid on buildings once owned by ratepayers through CBIC and then on sold. Is this another reason you won't to commit you won't commit to freezing rates for residents doing it tough? That was to Councillor Allen, wasn't it? Yes, Councillor Allen. Yes, that's right, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Councillor Cassidy, uh, for, for the question. Um, first to the operations of CBIC. There, um, CBIC is an investment business. Um, the um, investments they undertake and uh, the reporting on those investments is all clearly outlined. Um, you know, it's very transparent. They produce an annual report. They've got a website that um, outlines all the projects that are going on. They've got an independent board. So the fact that CBIC helps to uh, develop um, buildings that may ultimately be used by council is a good thing. We've had some absolutely first-class facilities built in partnership with CBIC. And uh, obviously the, the one closest to me is the uh, Chermside, uh, the North Regional Business Centre at Chermside. Um, CBIC develops those properties. Um, they then, if uh, the opportunity arises, if they get a particularly good offer on those, they will... Um, take those in order to maximise returns to the residents of Brisbane. And that's absolutely what their, um, their mandate is. They've um, been given a mandate to provide returns to the city of Brisbane. Um, do that through property investment. So, you know, whether that includes um, a yield on a building and ultimately a sale of a building, that is something that an investment fund such as CBIC does. That would be a normal part of their trading activities. Um, in the context of your point about, you know, CBIC dividends and uh, how they're paid every year, obviously we receive a dividend of circa $20 million a year from CBIC. Um, a consistent Let's dividend flow is something we expect Please from let them. Let the answer be heard in silence. And that's something that, uh, you know, we, we look to achieve with them uh, year in, year out. And as you know, that $20 million goes into our Green Future Fund for the uh, creation and acquisition of uh, recreational and green space in, in Brisbane. So a really admirable outcome there. So, you know, the uh, commentary and the criticism of CBIC is incredibly poorly founded. Um, the performance of CBIC over many years since inception has been exceptional. Oh, right. uh, returned over $130 million in uh, dividends to council. Their return has been in excess of 11% per year. The actual economic performance of that entity is beyond reproach. Now, to your question on rates. I mean, I know you're anxious, but 17th of June isn't too far away. You'll know more about what our intention is around rates. Certainly, um, the 
dividend payment from uh, CBIC as a part of our overall revenue stream, but I don't believe that that alone is the key determinant of what our uh, rates position might be on the 17th of June. So I know that you're um, anxious, but I will take the opportunity to remind you that this administration has had a very reasonable approach to rates and rate increases over its term in administration. Unlike yourselves, and I'll remind you, Councillor Cassidy, 6% four times. And in you fact, on one of those that's occasions, that's what you've it, was done. it was approaching 7%. So, Councillor Cassidy, I don't think you guys have a position on where on a, a credible position on rates. So I think the inflation rate is proven. We've been very, very consistent. We've been very, very modest. But in terms of what's going to happen in the councillors, please. No, sorry, Councillor Allen, please stop. Councillors, there's a lot of interjecting today. There's been a lot of interjecting in the last minute or so. Please, a question's been asked of Councillor Allen. I would like. Uh, for as many councillors as possible to hear the answer, please allow him to answer the question in silence. Councillor Allen. How many more seconds have I got, Mr Chair? 61. Thank you, Mr Chair. So, Councillor Cassidy, you will have to wait, but I will remind you that Brisbane has the lowest rates in South East Queensland. The services and um, programs that we provide and the infrastructure that we provide for this city is second to none. So in the context of a growing city, everything that we do in the city, the programs that we run, our rates are absolutely first class. Now, as I said, the budget has been a challenge. I've said that in recent weeks when you've asked a very similar question. I think that you will have to wait to the 17th of June. We are very, very conscious of the um, burden that residents and businesses in this city are facing. But I certainly think that uh, any speculation that the CBIC dividend is going to have a significant and tangible impact on the uh, decision. Councillor Allen, your time has expired. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further questions, Councillor Landers. My question is to the Chair of the Community, Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, the State Government announced late last week that they were again increasing the price of the State bulk water charge. With this bulk charge continuing to be one of the largest burdens on our local groups, how can the State Government do their part in supporting our clubs from, from facing financial ruin? Councillor Howard. Well, thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank Councillor Landers for the question. Um, Councillor Landers, at this very moment, every Australian, Queenslander and every resident in Brisbane is in the fight of their lives. No one is safe from the economic toll of this pandemic, and our community organisations are doing it tough. They're fighting an uphill battle of untold proportions. We know the devastating impact COVID has taken on them, on our entire communities. So I say to each and every one of them, we're with you and we will do everything possible to support you through this extraordinary time. Seven days ago, I spoke in this chamber about the hard work that council has been doing to support our community sports organisations. I told you that our clubs have been telling us that utility bills were their biggest concern, how they are struggling to water their fields and how desperately they need financial support. I talked about how Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner listened and answered their call for help by announcing a $1 million COVID-19 community sports fields water rebate. How council is giving more than 180 sports clubs a one-off water payment of $5,000, enough to pay for about 1 million litres of water. This is not the first time the Schrinner administration has answered their call for help, and it certainly won't be the last. Last year, Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner was there to answer the call for help when clubs were battling to keep their fields alive in the face of one of the driest, harshest droughts Brisbane has seen in years. We took immediate action to provide relief by doing whatever we could to ease the pain for our community clubs by giving them a 50% rebate on the retail component of their water bills, up to $5,000. And we called on the state government to do their part by cutting the exorbitant bulk water costs which account for 65% of every water bill. 
because we know that without enough water, especially over an extended period, playing fields can deteriorate so badly that they become unplayable and unsafe. These are just some examples of how the Schrinner administration has answered our club's calls for help. And so, Councillor Lander's question is important. What was Labor's answer to easing the pain of these enormous water bills that our clubs are struggling to keep up with? Labor's answer was to hike up the cost of water, not just for our community clubs, but every Queenslander right across the state. In the seven days since I spoke in this chamber about the $1 million of relief that we are providing to help our struggling sports clubs, Labor has come out and announced a 3.5% increase on their already unaffordable water prices. At a time when Queenslanders are in the fight of their lives, when residents, businesses and communities are struggling to pay their bills and make ends meet. The Labor state government decided to make this uphill battle even steeper, harder, tougher and more heartbreaking than it needed to be. While we are providing rent relief and water bill subsidies, Labor has decided to make the cost of staying alive more expensive and more impossible. Unlike our one-off payment to take $5,000 off the weight of their water bills, the state's price hike is not the first, not the second, not even the third, but the fifth time that Palaszczuk has hiked up water prices and hiked up the cost of living for Queenslanders. Now, Queenslanders are as tough as they come and we are Australia's fiercest battlers. But there, and there is no battle that's too tough and no disaster too big for us to handle. But I have to say that right now, Queenslanders are fed up and they're getting tired. They are sick and tired of fighting an uphill battle against the very people that are supposed to be leading the way and lifting them up, not pushing them to da down. So today I ask every councillor in this chamber to join me in calling on the state government to put an end to this madness and to stop this endless barrage of price hikes. Queenslanders deserve better. It's not acceptable for the Palaszczuk government to treat the state's coffers like bottomless pits and then punish Queenslanders for the state Labor government's reckless financial decisions. Send the Palaszczuk government a message that the taxpayer is not an ATM. It's time for the state Labor government to take responsibility for their actions and to stop relying on hard-working taxpayers to pick up the slack for their reckless financial management. This should end right now. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further questions? Uh, point of, is that a point, point of order? order. Hammond? Yep, point, Councillor Hammond. Yep. <clears throat> um, point of order, Mr Chair. I move a suspension of standing orders to allow me to move an urgency motion in relation to the state Labor State Government's bulk water charge. So, seconder? Yep. Yes, okay. yeah. Sorry. No, urgency motion um, from <coughs> Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Adams. Councillor Hammond, three minutes to urgency. <coughs> I trust that this uh, resolution that you are this urgency motion will be distributed to the CCLO and distributed to all councillors by email. Um, That's correct, do. Mr Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. As three councillor... Minutes. Sorry? You have three minutes. Please limit your comments to urgency. Okay. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, as Councillor Howard so eloquently outlined, we heard late last week that the state government will again jack up the prices of state bulk water charges by 3.5% in the 2021 financial year. This is unbelievable by the Labor State Government. We are in the midst of a global pandemic where our sporting clubs and community groups are fighting for their lives to remain open, to be there for whatever age you are, whether young or old, when we finally get back to some resemblance of normal life. We also know that the biggest cost of these community groups, particularly sporting clubs, is the cost of water to put on their fields. And what is the largest component of the water bill, Mr Chair? Well, that would be the state government bulk water charge. The state government bulk water charge can account up to an extraordinary 75% of Councillor Hammond, water Councillor bills. Hammond, can I, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, much of what you've said so far is substantive. Can you please, mm -hmm. um, can I please ask you to bring your comments back to urgency why the matter must be dealt with now? Well, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we are. Uh, this is urgent because we are urgently calling on the state government to do the right thing. The residents of Brisbane want nothing more for their local sporting clubs, 
leagues, clubs, soccer, bridge to get back up and running once our lives come back to normal after the following of the global pandemic. The state government needs to make changes. This is why it's urgent. They need to make changes to help these clubs in their time of need, not to burden them with the extra costs of essential things like water. Thank you. I will now uh, put the urgency resolution. All those order. point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yep, we still haven't been given the motion, so it's not no, reasonable. No, no, hang on. You've made your point of order. You've not yet received it. It has been sent from the CCLO. You will receive it very, very shortly. All right. I'll now put the urgency, the, the, the uh, the vote on the topic of urgency. All those who believe this matter is urgent, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And those who do not believe this matter to be urgent, please say no and raise your hands. Aye. No. I think that was a no. But no, yeah, it was a no, sorry. It's a no. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so uh, my, my interpretation of the Threshold of two thirds has been met and we will now have an urgency debate on this matter. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that this council acknowledges the state government's 2009 decision to remove water and water pricing responsibility from council's control. We further note that significant investment council has undertaken in reducing water costs for sporting clubs and community groups. The state got Sorry, the state bulk water charge is the single largest cost these clubs and groups can face, which has seen an increase of almost 215% since 2009. We therefore call on the state government to urgently introduce measures to reduce this financial burden on our sporting clubs and community groups. Seconded. Seconded. All right. I have the uh, resolution as read, moved by Councillor Hammond, <coughs> seconded by Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor Hammond, uh, is there any debate, Councillor Hammond? Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. I know the Labor Party don't like hearing about the failings of their own party or their mates up in William Street taking advantage of sporting clubs and community groups to help full fill their coffers, which they have left bone dry. But this is urgent. I know in my ward of Marchant, whether you play soccer, cricket, rugby league or play lawn bowls, these bills um, are, are crippling our clubs, the water bills, and they are suffering. One of my clubs, because I don't want to identify them in any way, one of my clubs one year had a $70,000 water bill, $70,000, and 75% of this was made up of the state government bulk water charge. Another club sent me through a copy of their water bill, the Urban Utilities Bill. This bill just recently, the latest one, was a cost of $17,468. Um, the state government's bulk water charge of the amount on this bill was staggering $11,000. $354.20. That leaves them of a usage bill of $6,000 $113.80. With the generous um, offer that the Lord Mayor did and sent out a relief package for the club, that le of $5,000, that leaves the usage cost of this club as $113.80. On the same day last week, the increases of the Labor government's bulk water charge was announced. Urban Utilities came out and announced that they would be freezing increases to water and sewerage prices for six months. That's freezing the price of water and sewerage. Urban Utilities recognise that the past three months have been exceptionally tough, not only for our sporting clubs and community groups, but also the residents and businesses within their catchment. This is a move we can have only hope that the Labor Party would follow and pass down from the state. Those in the council opposition are only too happy to point fingers and argue that, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> and argue that they think this administration is not doing enough. But what about this outrageous move by their mates down at the state? 
The Schrinner administration, on the other hand, unlike the state government, which is only too happy to gouge community groups run by volunteers. Mr Chair, we are prepared to put our money where our mouth is and invest in these facilities, provide them with options to help them reduce their cost and reduce their water bills. In December last year, this administration announced support for more than 180 clubs across Brisbane with an offer of up to $5,000 in rebates on their water bills and helping them adopt sustainable water practices when we're in the middle of drought conditions. And then, Mr Chair, just three weeks ago, we announced a further one-off payment of $5,000 in water rebates, where more than 150 sporting clubs were eligible. As the Lord Mayor recently said, and I, I truly believe, the sporting clubs are the lifeblood of our community. But the coronavirus and the state government restrictions have forced most to close their doors without a healing hand. I'm urging the state government to abandon their increase of 3.5% because this is a slap in the face for our community clubs and um, sporting groups and volunteers. We know the state government have pushed back their budget until October this year. So at the very least, they could give these clubs and group some kind of reprieve on the significant costs they are facing without the support of revenue coming in through their door. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. And what a um, pathetic and desperate attempt um, by members of this administration to distract from uh, their failings when it comes to supporting community clubs. And it's quite amazing, uh, Chair, to think that um, this administration didn't talk about this issue uh, they didn't care about this issue. And this issue has been around for a lot longer than the last couple of weeks or the last couple of months until a little bit of public pressure uh, was being applied to them. Um, we've had over the last couple of um, the last couple of weeks alone over 1,200 residents of Brisbane sign our petition calling for more support uh, for our community clubs, not just sporting clubs, uh, but all our um, community clubs and um, leasing organisations. We've had dozens of um, sports clubs and community groups sign our open letter to the Lord Mayor, which was delivered to him last week. Uh, and it's only after this, it's only after this public campaign and this public pressure that we finally see um, the old catch-up LNP think, oh, we better do something because people are starting to get angry. I mean, the Lord Mayor and these LNP councillors are like uh, those French revolutionaries chair when they... Uh, saw a mob running past, they thought to themselves, I better find out where they're going so I can lead them there. They've never had an original idea. All they do is uh, try and use these forums to pick a fight with the state government because they know their LNP colleagues up there uh, in state parliament are completely and utterly useless. Um, so, Chair, let's, let's have a look at this administration's track record. Councillor Howard and, and the Lord Mayor are very quick to point the finger at other levels of government over water bills uh, that are being charged to struggling community clubs. Yet every day of the week, this same council that is run by Adrian Schrinner receives more than $500,000 in clear profit from QUU. That's $500,000 each and every day. That's $200 million each and every year from water that is sold by QUU. Now, in the motion here, we says, it says that we acknowledge the state government's decision to remove water uh, and water pricing responsibilities from council's control. What also came with that was a complete uh, and utter clearing of council's debt. And what we've seen under this Lord Mayor's stewardship uh, is the ballooning of that debt to $2.5 billion. We see every project that he touches turns to absolute garbage and mud. Uh, and we know that the reason that he's not providing adequate support for our community clubs, including our sporting clubs, all the while uh, receiving $200 million a year from QUU from the residents of Brisbane uh, is because of his um, complete and utter financial ineptitude chair. So the, the water grant that was given to the 150 or so grass sports clubs soaked up about a day and a half's worth of this council's water profits. So when you look at the actual facts here, uh, Councillor Hammond, through you, Chair, uh, in your own, own goal here, 
is that you are highlighting the fact that um, 363 and a half days worth of water profit from QUU is going into servicing the hideous amount of debt that this administration has racked up through failed projects. You are only giving $5,000 as a one-off grant to um, a small number of community clubs, and you think that is enough. Councillor, I mean, Cass Councillor Cassie, I appreciate you premised your comments with through you, but I must ask uh, you to refer to other councils in the third person, please. Yeah, sorry, Chair. Um, so we, we have clubs around this city, not just sporting clubs, but clubs that are in council lease sites that are struggling to keep the lights on. Some of those clubs are literally crumbling around their ears. Uh, and we have an administration chair here that um, has no plan for our clubs. Uh, they have no care for our clubs and our community organisations. And all they're interested in doing is when a bit of public pressure is applied to them for their failings, Chair, is to cr try and create some conflict with the state government to distract from their own failings. So while this administration receives $500,000 each and every day in clear profit for doing absolutely nothing but owning 85% of QUU, um, I don't buy this argument uh, one bit. It is up to this administration, it is up to this council to support our community and sporting clubs. Instead of passing the buck chair, this council needs to stand up and be counted for once. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, uh, for the opportunity to speak on the urgency motion. Um, look, the political game playing that's going on um, with this motion and uh, the LNP's actions today are doing a significant disservice to the people of Brisbane, in my view. Um, this is all about party politics, and that is really disappointing for our, our sporting and community clubs who are actually struggling and doing it very tough. Um, a number of my clubs have indicated to me that they um, did not get the entire rebate um, and yet their water bills are quite significant. They have very large playing fields. So I asked just very recently um, about uh, the $5,000 grant um, that this council is giving and I was told I, I, I wasn't entitled to that information um, and that if I wanted to get information about uh, the eligible sporting clubs in my area, I'd have to follow the councillor RTI process. Now, this is a simple question about asking which clubs in my ward are eligible and going to get the $5,000 grant. Um, so, you know, if this administration wants to play stupid political games um, with the state government and with local councillors who are trying to work with their clubs, I find their behaviour to be quite appalling. Um, the motion, uh, as it's been moved here today, um, is just a pathetic juvenile attempt uh, to malign the state Labor government. We're, what, three, four months out from a state election? The LNP clearly doesn't want to talk about their agenda in this council uh, through questions or through motions. Um, is there a motion on the table from the uh, LNP administration to improve things for our local sporting clubs? No, there is not. There is simply a motion on the table uh, to attack the state government, uh, you know, and to try and praise themselves, we know the significant investment council has undertaken in reducing water costs for sporting clubs and community groups. I don't think you guys have got any idea about the pain Johnston, um, that community... Please, Councillor Johnston, please use... Uh, please refer to the councillors yes. on a third person and through me, please. I don't think the LNP councillors have got any idea, any idea about the pain uh, that sporting clubs are going through. The fact that you won't even discuss um, the significant investment council has undertaken which I understand today it's been up to $5,000 for some clubs, not all clubs, um, that, that's pathetic. It is pathetic. And it is pathetic from a point where you have ignored clubs in my ward for a very long time um, and now uh, when they need help, you are simply ignoring the real issue 
Council Council, I only asked you a moment ago, and you did it once, and then went back to old habits for three times. Please uh, refer to other councillors in the third person. I apologise, Mr Chairman, and I'll make sure I'm raising this issue with you and others do it too. I apologise. to. No, no, no. As I said... I apologised. No, no. I've let you get away with it more than I've called you out up on it. Okay. I don't expect misuse of point of orders from you, all right? I let you get away with a great deal. I'm asking you... Uh, I let you get away with... Uh, yeah. very I didn't make a point of order, Mr Chairman. And, and... I'm right, and trying to so, debate the motion. No, don't debate me. And I'm then, debating the motion. No, no, I'm speaking, so you're not. Um, so in future, um, please don't misuse points of order uh, as you've threatened. <laughs> Make a point and of order. Please use uh, the correct titles and for all councillors and please refer to people in the third person. Councillor Johnston. Uh, oh. Further speakers. No, I'm speaking most no, definitely. No, no. I am definitely speaking no. on this motion. Please. Yes. So, let me be clear, I haven't made a point of order. I'm just trying to speak on the urgency motion, which tries to praise the LNP administration for handing out a miserly amount of money whilst undertaking a juvenile political attack on the state Labor government. At the same time, when local councillors are asking for information about how this will be rolled out locally, we are told we are not entitled to that information. Now, if this was such a state, if this was such a great idea uh, by the LNP, um, then I can't see why that information would not be readily made available to the clubs uh, and uh, to the local councillors. Um, it is so disappointing that all this administration wants to do is talk about the state Labor government up in George Street rather than talking about what we can do as a council to help our community groups. Uh, and it is simply a political distraction. It is juvenile politics and it is not acceptable in my view. Um, now, uh, all of this, the hypocritical part of all of this, is that um, this administration has um, only just recently frozen its own fees in relation to um, clubs. Uh, it has um, raised them year after year after year. Um, the leasing um, requirements that this council puts on clubs, condition audits, um, huge costs in terms of capital improvements and maintenance. Um, this council puts extraordinary pressure on clubs. And if you ask any single sporting club out there, they will tear their hair out telling you how hard it is um, that this council makes it, not the state government, that this council makes it um, for them to go about their business. So do I think the state Labor government should be doing more on water? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, they, you know, who knows what they're doing. Um, they're completely incompetent. Um, but I have to agree with one thing Councillor Cassidy said. The LNP opposition up in George Street are so incompetent if they can't hold that state government to account for how badly they are failing to Point deliver for our community sporting clubs. Point of order, order Councillor Adams. I've listened for the eight minutes and the imputing motive has been worse than what I was saying. She's just straight into the exact same territory that she complained about. I ask you to bring her back to the debate. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Yes, I agree that Councillor Johnson, for the bulk of her presentation, uh, impugned motive on others to a much greater extent than she oh, would have other people. Yeah. However, okay. uh, however, this is a debating chamber. All right, so Councillor Johnson would expect a higher standard from others than she's presented herself today. That's true. However, I, uh, I would ask her and all councillors to resist the urge to impugn motive. Councillor Johnston. So let me be clear. I was just actually agreeing with you all that the state Labor government are a bit incompetent. Councillor that Johnson, is I, not I, imputing motive. I've asked, asked you to use the proper titles and speak in third person on multiple occasions. I, I appreciate that you're a little worked up now, but please um, uh, maintain decorum. Councillor Johnston. Oh, my God. Righto. It's going to be like this all meeting. I'm done. This is a joke. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I wasn't going to enter into debate on this motion because I could see that it was a pretty shallow attempt at party political games. But I've been feeling quite angry over the past few minutes and I wanted to share 
my disgust at the rank hypocrisy I've just witnessed in this chamber. Now, I'm sure all councillors across the political spectrum will agree that I'm generally quite restrained in my criticism and I try to avoid singling out individual councillors and I try to avoid making party political criticisms as much as possible. I try to hold myself to a standard of respect um, and, and offer respect to others even when they disagree with the positions they're taking. But I am disgusted at the hypocrisy of this chamber when I, I see we've just, we've just spent all this time moving a motion, calling on a higher level of government to take action, and fair enough, that's great. That it, it makes sense for council to be advocating about issues that are primarily under the control of, the high, of a higher level of government. I think that's an appropriate thing to do, to be saying to the state government or the federal government, you need to take action on this. And yet we've just had a presentation from a member of the public about the importance of raising the unemployment rate, where Councillor Allen stood up in this chamber and said it is not appropriate for this council administration to weigh in on issues that are the are responsibility of a higher level of government. There's a clear contradiction here, a very obvious example of disgusting, contemptible hypocrisy where the LNP administration has on the one hand said, no, no, we don't get involved in issues that are about a higher level of government. And then on the other hand, has taken up meeting time debating a motion which simply calls on a higher level of government to take action. There's a very obvious contradiction here in terms of strategy and, and what the LNP considers to be appropriate behaviour and appropriate fields of responsibility for this council to weigh in on it. And that contradiction is not resolved logically. It is simply a function of selfishness, self-interested party politicking, and a contempt for the lower income residents of this city. Because that public speaker earlier on was calling for something very sim simple. They were calling for this council to support a motion calling on a higher level of government to take an action. And that action would have materially improved the lives of many Brisbane residents. And that's exactly what we're doing again now. We're now debating a motion calling on a higher level of government to take action. So why the hell is it that this council administration, that these LNP councillors feel that it's fine to put forward this motion but don't even want to countenance the possibility of debating a motion about calling for an increase to job seeker payments or maintaining a higher rate of job seeker payments? I'm just, I'm just livid. I'm, I'm so frustrated and disappointed and disgusted with the LNP councillors in this chamber who maintain this double standard and pat themselves on the back like they're doing a good thing for the community, like they're standing up as community advocates when actually they are throwing the most vulnerable residents of their community under the bus by failing to speak up publicly about such an important issue. Uh, there are councillors in this chamber from, from the LNP who I actually respect, who I think are reasonable people and who I think try to do the right thing. But I do not understand how you can look yourselves in the mirror and play these party political games and score cheap political points while refraining to speak up on the important issues that we should be expressing a view on because, oh, that's the responsibility of a high level of government and we don't get into that. What disgusting hypocrisy. For the speakers. Councillor Griffiths. Yes, uh, thanks, Mr Chair. And I, I will um, just speak, I won't speak for 10 minutes on this, but I just want to add some comments to this. I, I have to um, say I agree with a number of councillors here that this is just a stunt. Um, there doesn't appear to be anything genuine behind it. And if anything, it's deflecting on the performance of this LNP administration. All they're doing is backing their mates up in George Street. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's disappointing that this is how they're playing the game. Uh, Q, you have announced a six-month freeze, and they've done that specifically because of COVID. 
So that actually has been put in place by the state government. This is actually to help many residents. They've frozen the bulk water charge to help many residents. This is a good thing that they've done. We should be acknowledging that and congratulating them for doing that. Um, you know, we as a council take a massive profit. We own 80% of QUU. Um, what do we take? $200 million a year in profit, in profit, into our own coffers. Are we offering to cut back on that? Are we offering to redistribute that to any of our residents? Are we offering to do more for our sports clubs other than the, the pathetic little amount we are doing? You know, we, we should be ashamed, the LNP should be ashamed of this motion and the hypocrisy of this motion. Now, and I find it very interesting that, that the Lord Mayor and the LNP are causing, calling for a greater freeze on, on QU and uh, the bulk water supply. I hope, I hope this is an indication that the Lord Mayor will be freezing rates for the next year. I hope that's the message that we're taking out of this because at the moment, um, if they don't freeze rates, then it, it clearly stands to show the sheer hypocrisy of their very action in moving this motion. The other interesting fact that I found from QU that I, I thought um, hasn't been reflected in this is that they are going to spend 346, 350 million on providing infrastructure in the next financial year across our city and across four other cities. This is good for the economy. This is good for residents. This is good for development. This is what uh, they need to be doing so that the economy moves on. We need to keep people working. We need to keep people in business. And playing games like this won't do that. Once again, I hope, and I ask this as a question to the Lord Mayor, through you, Mr Chair, I hope this uh, is an indication that the LNP will be freezing rates next financial year for all those people out there battling uh, with, this, uh, with the situation they're in uh, with COVID. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. And uh, I rise to speak on obviously a very emotional topic when it comes to the chamber and something I think that people have taken uh, a little bit hysterically. Um, we're hearing stupid political game, juvenile political attack, abhorrent hypocrisy. What we are doing here today is moving a motion to support our sporting clubs and community clubs who have an enormous water bill that the LNP administration has made significant contribution to over the last six months by asking the state government to reduce their water bulk bill. That is it. Reduce the bulk bill water charges. Councillor Hammond made it very clear in her example, a over $11,000 bill came down to $130 without the bulk water, uh, water bill because of the work that the council have done to support them. We hear from Councillor Johnson that these stupid political games, well, these stupid political games, as Councillor Johnson calls them, through you, Mr Chair, is what the LNP are standing here today calling supporting our local clubs. Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Adams take a question about the importance of supporting low-income residents? Yeah, Councillor Adams, will you take a question? No. Uh, she won't be taking a question today. Councillor Adams, please continue. Because with respect to the speech that Councillor Shree just gave us, or should I say the lecture that Councillor Shree just gave us, I respect Councillor Shree's opinion. He is more than uh, allowed to have that opinion, but I don't agree with him. The only important issues that Councillor Shree sees are the issues that he thinks are important. Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Adams take a question about the difference between yeah, water no, bills no. and unemployment you know, welfare? You know, you know that that's not how you do this. Um, <laughs> that's, you know, how well, that's not how the process for asking a question works. However, I will ask Councillor Adams, would you take a question? No, thank you, Mr Chair.
Councillor Adams has declined. Councillor Adams, please continue. Because the reality is, Councillor Shreve, if you haven't figured it out, we've got people in Brisbane who work in our sporting clubs. And if we can keep our sporting clubs going, we can keep people in employment. Some of them have been able to access JobKeeper. Some of them haven't. But you know what? I bet you they'd want a job over JobKeeper any day of the week. And that is what this administration is focused on. Councillor Johnson said, we only just recently started supporting our clubs. We announced a retro package of relief from the 30th of March for rates relief, a $7.9 million business relief package to all businesses on council land and leases and properties, including those sporting clubs. We gave a top-up amount to $5,000 to our sporting clubs in January, which is what Councillor Johnson was talking about, not the second grant of water for $5,000 that we gave just recently, the second one in six months, Councillor Johnson. Get your details right. Facts are just not anything that Councillor Johnson worries about. Point and just order. to put on the record, Mr Chair, Point Councillor order. Johnson did not Point ask order. for her award in... Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Mr Chairman, I know you've been very strict about this today, so I presume you'll want Councillor Adams to stop referring to me in the first person. She's already corrected herself, but yes, I would have expected it. Yes, sorry, I've said through you, Mr Chair. Mm -hmm. Through you, Mr Chair, I will correct Councillor Johnson that uh, she did not ask for her details from her ward offer sporting clubs and get refused. She asked for the entire city and was correctly told to go through the information request process. Any councillor can get information they want on their ward. But as I said, Councillor Johnson does not let the details get in the way of a good political debate in this place, which she does as much as anybody else when she sits up and talks about juvenile political Order. 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 Through you, Mr Order. Chair. Called you twice. Can't hear you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, well, I've called you twice. All Thank right. You. I appreciate that. Well, Councillor Adams yet again referred to me in the first person, Mr. Chairman, and I know that you don't like this, and I'm sure you would like to call her up on the matter. Well, Councillor Johnston, uh, yeah. Councillor Adams had corrected herself, as we've said before, you left the screen, uh, and the time when I asked you, where I insisted it, you'd already, um, I'd only pulled you up on the third occasion. When you'd done it, not the first, the third, uh, and I, um, I only pull people up on it when they do it multiple times, uh, and I uh, insist it as a courtesy. All right, so I appreciate that you um, that you uh, like you enjoy these sorts of tetetes you have with me, but uh, I must ask you to always try and keep them in proportion. That. Uh, I only asked you on the third error that you made, not the first, okay? Councillor Adams. Um, can I just clarify, Councillor Chair, so if I want to rebut the debate made by the Councillor for Tennyson through you, I need to call her the Councillor for Tennyson ward, is that correct? Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Okay, thank you. Just say you yes. or she, but Councillor Johnston, please. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I would just like to just respond to a comment made uh, by the councillor for Maruka, councillor Griffiths, that the state government froze QUU's fees. Well, you can't have your argument both ways, councillor Griffiths. Either we are the stakeholders or the state is. Council owned QUU, yes, retailer froze their charges, not the state government. What did the state government do? They jacked up their water bills and that is why we are making this debate here today. Unfortunately, Councillor Cook is not with us in the chamber because on the 17th of May on ABC Radio, she made it very clear how she felt about her local um, representatives. And she does represent her local areas as a member of my committee. We talk quite frequently about her local areas. Clubs are crying out for help, she's claimed, because they are facing possible closure and they need urgent financial assistance. They simply don't have the funds for ongoing expenses like water. I spoke to one of those clubs yesterday who just got a $15,000 water bill, but they have no income to pay that bill. Sounds very much like Councillor Hammonds as well. I must pity that Councillor Cook isn't here to vote with us today in saying thank you, administration, for over $5,000 worth of support to our sporting clubs. 
so far on top of the business relief package. And please, state government, stop hacking and jacking up your prices of your bulk water bills. In three weeks' time, a water bill just went up by another $525 a quarter for that club she's talking about. Do you think they're going to be able to afford that any more now than they could when Councillor Cook was speaking to them in May? Maybe the ALP should just organise another jointly signed letter and see how it goes if they send it up to the other end of George Street. Look, what we see time and time again is a state government with no plan except looking after themselves. I remember when my time as Lifestyle Chair, we were having this same argument with the single biggest cost for local clubs five years on is still the state bulk water charge. Despite being smack bang in the middle of an economic crisis, corporations are gouging, well, corporations, well, the state government's corporations are gouging small clubs to water their lawns. Those clubs employ people, Councillor Shree, through you, Mr Chair. It's not good enough just to say we'll delay it, we'll decrease it, but no, no, they haven't even done that. They're jacking it up and it's about time that Labor on that side of the chamber and the Independent Councillor and the Greens Councillor stood up for their local people and said enough, absolutely enough. Thank goodness the people of Brisbane saw through that facade in March and we've got an administration that are here to support our local sporting clubs, our local businesses and the people of Brisbane and I'm looking forward to the June 17th budget, which will do exactly that. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, listen, I want to end the debate on this motion because um, I think we're forgetting a number of things that have happened over the last couple of years. And um, does anyone want to remember the water remissions that pensioners uh, uh, used to get? Uh, that we took away for anyone that was becoming a pensioner wouldn't be able to apply. That was removed, and of course, pensioners who moved, pensioners who moved addresses would uh, lose that uh, support as well. And no, at the time, and at the time, we uh, raised this issue about water and how how important it was for those pensioners to continue to get that uh, remission. Uh, because it was worth a lot of money. And of course, we did point out at the time that our income from QUU was uh, approaching $200 million and how petty it was that we would take this small amount of money, which was only a few million dollars, I think, at the time, uh, away from the pensioners. So now we're coming and we're talking about um, the support for sporting groups, which Listen, we all love our sporting groups, and we would want to um, we would want to support them as much as we can as a council. Uh, but I think council is being really disingenuous about the income that they receive on a yearly basis for doing nothing. You do not do any work for this money that comes in. You should be thanking the arrangement that goes back so many many years ago, two thousand nine, whatever it was, uh, that made this arrangement so that this, this council could have an income support from the state government uh, uh, indirectly uh, for doing nothing to be able to support our bottom line. Now, you would hope that some of that money, a lot more of that money could be used in these particular, in the next 12 months to support our, our clubs rather than trying to hypocritically uh, suggest or demand uh, that the state government um, reduce bulk water charges or eliminate them for a period of time. Um, I'm still not really clear on this motion is exactly what you want, but um, I just wanted to, uh, again, reinforce the fact that this, this council for uh, a couple of years ago removed any new pensioners from water remissions. Um, and if you moved, you were then uh, not able to attract that water emission as well. It was a very small amount of money. We made we made from this side of this side of the chamber. We made the the point that it was a very small amount of money. But what did the Lord Mayor say at the time? We could not afford to continue with these water emissions into the future for new applicants. And I think today 
you really are showing um, a hypocritical um, way of thinking about these things. We didn't do what we needed to do for our pensioners, and now you're expecting the state government to do something that you won't do yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Councillor Hammond. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. It was a very interesting debate and I thank all the speakers for participating. But Councillor Strunk, not sure where you're getting at, but I am not going to thank the Labor state government for jacking up the state government bulk water charges by 215% to put into their coffers. I am not going to thank them for that and nor are my sporting groups. Um, it's interesting that Councillor Cassidy, sorry, I nearly had to laugh when he was talking, that he said that um, we've only just jumped into action on this. Councillor Cassidy, where have you been? This We froze and we gave the rebate earlier on this year. We've given almost $10,000 to some sporting clubs this financial year as part of their usage of the bulk water charge. Um, you only woke up yeah, when the Lord like Mayor himself announced that he was Hammond. giving more. Councillor more Hammond, than. please refrain from referring to other councillors as you and please send all, uh, refer all comments through the chair and refer to councillors in the third person. Thank Councillor. you. Um, through you, Mr Chair, Councillor Cassidy, you only woke up when the Lord Mayor, Adrian Schrinner, announced some more help for our sporting groups. Within days of this pandemic um, coming out, the Lord Mayor froze the fees for our sporting clubs um, and tried to help our sporting clubs. It's interesting, my community saw straight through the um, opposition's political stunt about Order. doing the petition Order. that Order. was sent... Yeah, uh, Councillor Hammond's misleading the chamber. She's a bit confused yeah, about... No, no, the no, 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 no. She's definitely misleading the chamber. Thank you. Councillor Hammond, please continue. My community groups contacted me when they received um, the petition that their Labor state government yeah. banks um, sent yeah. through to our sporting groups appalled by order. the political order. stunt. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. I have, call, I have called you. I do call you more promptly. I don't know why people aren't hearing me today. But I have, I have called you... It was the third time, so I do. I am doing it. Uh, all I could hear was Councillor Hammond. I apologise. Um, just to be clear, Councillor Cassidy made a point of order, and you have declared, to my understanding, last week that misleading the chamber is a point of order. Um, so, can I ask why you did not make a ruling on that point of order, please, and ask that you do so? Uh, I have. I did review as it was discussed last week. We had a uh, request about the nature of the point of order misleading the chamber. And as I said at the time, it's not expressed or explicit. It's one that we accepted uh, at the time. I have consulted with a few people um, and it's my view that um, its use should be limited to the strict nature that it is written into the rules. Now, Councillor Johnston, uh, you you uh, have enjoyed using that particular point of order often. Which which rule do you think allows misleading the chamber? Mr Chairman, I'm the person that asked you to make a clarification on this. Um, Councillor DeWitt made up um, the rule that you could mislead the chamber, and that happened about a decade ago. And for the past decade, that rule has uh, been allowed to be used. Um, but different chairs have interpreted it differently. It's not in the meeting's local law, but I asked you last week to make a ruling on whether or not we could use it, and my understanding was last week you told Councillor Adams that you could, but just then you said to Councillor Cassidy that he couldn't. So I just seek consistency and clarity about whether it's a valid point of order, and I seek a clear ruling from you. All right. You'd like a clear ruling? Uh, because it's not explicitly stated within the rules, because I believe that Councillors... Uh, you use the point of order misleading the chamber, in my opinion, cynically to interject their own arguments into the speeches of others. It will no longer be permitted. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, um, 
Mr. Chair, uh, as I said, my clubs were absolutely appalled by the, um, the email that they received from their state Labor members um, uh, pushing through the Brisbane City Council are doing nothing for their clubs because they know that is not true. They also expressed their displeasure to their local state member um, and asked him to desist, desist from playing games. This state member does nothing for the club, only turns up for the quick photo opportunity. Um, I'd also like to say um, to Councillor Shree, I know people are doing it tough and I understand your point of view, but these sporting groups and community groups also do support um, people who are in our most vulnerable. Um, a lot of our sporting groups actually pay for some of the children um, to actually play these sports and be a part of our community. So this really is important to try and reduce those costs on the clubs so they can continue doing so. It's not just about sporting, Councillor Shree. It's also about our other community groups where people go to be with people, in some cases, that helps with their mental health issue. So I just want to make that clear that our sporting groups are as important, are very important to keep going for our whole community. Um, I also would like to add that um, the ALP um, councillors are trying to insinuate that this council absolutely does nothing. Well, I'm not sure what they use the Lord Mayor's community funds for and how they support their local groups, because this money is vital to our local groups to sustain just sometimes simple things like fertiliser through. I'm not sure if the opposition councillors actually get to speak to their local groups or listen to their local groups because for years I've been working with my local groups about the ridiculous cost of the state government bulk water climb charges. In closing, I'm just going to repeat those figures and I hope the, everyone in this chamber supports this motion. One of my clubs, Sporting Bill, 17460 Keeps going back. State government bulk water charge was eleven thousand three hundred and fifty-four dollars twenty. That left the club six hundred um, six thousand one hundred thirteen dollars eighty with the five thousand they got off with a bill of one hundred thirteen eighty. Surely the state government can freeze this state government bulk water charge of three point five percent, three point five percent, freeze it and so give our clubs some kind of support instead of jacking it up in this terrible time of need of 3.5%, um, noting that they've given themselves a pay rise in their own um, uh, costs that they can go and self-promote themselves before an October election. We know that they push their budget out because they're afraid of this budget and they don't want to help our, our community. They've pushed their budget out until October because they are afraid. Come on, state government. Put your money where your mouth is and stand by our community. They need you right now. They need your support. Please think seriously about reducing this ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous increase of 3.5%. I look forward to this whole council. Stand united and say no to the state. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'll now put the resolution. <clears throat> All those in favour say aye and raise your hands. Aye. 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 Thank you. Please lower your hands. And all those against, say no and raise your hands. Nope. No. Oh. The motion is carried. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Adams and Councillor Landers. Please ring the bells. <laughs> all councillors are present. Please turn uh, We'll now turn off the bells. All right. Again, all those in favour, say aye, raise your hand and hold it there so it may be counted. Aye. 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 Thank you. Please lower your hands. And those against, please say no and raise your hands and hold it there so it may be counted. No. Oh. Thank you. Please lower your hands. Clarks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour, four against and two abstentions. Thank you, the ayes have it. 
Councillors, we will now return to question time. Time remaining is 16 minutes, 20 seconds. Excuse me. Further questions? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, during the COVID-19 yeah, shutdown, some homeless prison nights have been housed temporarily in empty apartments or hotels. Point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. I'm sorry, Councillor Shree, um, but something's wrong because I should be getting a question before Councillor Shree. I didn't get a question last week and I haven't got a question this week and I believe um, that on the pro rata system, I'd be eligible for a question now. Um, as we discussed last week, after the scrutiny placed upon uh, the question time by yourself, Councillor Johnson and Councillor Shree, uh, there was um, the pro rata system had not been satisfied the way that it had been required to be. And I had, uh, or excuse me, that's not correct. I had uh, the pro rata system was at one end and it was biased heavily in your favour. As a result, questions had to be uh, provided to the Labor Party to adjust that and it was square at the conclusion of the last meeting. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Can I suggest that going forward it might be appropriate to either publish or to privately circulate a run-in tally of the of the questions? This could be circulated by the Council and Committee's email list I just so it. councillors can keep track because okay. I've, I've had concerns in the past that you haven't been keeping track well. Uh, well, we do keep track. Well, I do keep track, I should say. Sure. And my view that this question belongs to a crossbencher. Uh, I apologise if Councillor Johnson felt it was hers. Councillor Shree was the first hand I saw from the crossbench. Councillor Shree. Sure. I'll start the question again to the Lord Mayor. During the COVID-19 shutdown, some Br homeless Brisbaneites have been housed temporarily in empty apartments or hotels. This pandemic has reminded all of us that offering vulnerable people stable housing actually benefits everyone in our city. So I'm wondering what steps will your administration be taking to ensure that homeless residents placed in temporary crisis accommodation aren't pushed back onto the streets in a few months' time and that the supply of public housing in our city actually increases? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Street, for the question. It was interesting because we have been uh, talking about um, homelessness uh, in this chamber and uh, something that council has been focused on for quite some time. And I previously said uh, in response to uh, questions from Councillor Shree, I've uh, talked about the, the long um, public housing waiting list and how the state government had no plan to actually build uh, the many public houses that are required. Um, I think there was more than 30,000 people on the waiting list, I'm speaking from memory, um, yet there were plans to build just a handful, a few thousand um, houses for those people. Yet come COVID and suddenly um, the state government has found homes for many of our homeless residents. Um, and Councillor Shri has referred to some of the situations uh, there are um, people who are previously homeless that are being housed in apartments and hotels in various parts of the city. Uh, so there would be an expectation that if the state government can step in in this way during COVID, that they should do a lot more to step in uh, in ordinary times as well. Now, we will continue to play our part as a council uh, and we have in our submission to other levels of government, including the federal government, um, put forward funding requests for um, support, for additional support for um, the construction of uh, affordable and social housing um, to the federal government. I've been working with the capital city Lord Mayors on a submission that uh, has gone to the federal government, asking for a whole range of initiatives across the capital cities of Australia, including support for more, the construction of more uh, affordable and social housing uh, in response to COVID and as part of the stimulus program. Uh, so I'll continue to work with the other levels of government in that respect. Uh, but I have to say, I don't have a lot of confidence 
uh, that this state government will um, come up with a decent long-term plan. Um, and it is concerning that uh, once the COVID immediate situation is over, that those people that currently have homes might end up back on the street. Um, and so Council Shree has raised a very legitimate point. Homeless people or previously homeless people being put up in homes during COVID may become homeless uh, once this immediate crisis is over. Uh, and that is not a good outcome at all and just highlights the need for um, all three levels of government to work together to make sure that we have a plan uh, to deliver improvements to the affordable and social housing in our city. Uh, we will continue working, as I said, with the federal government uh, in terms of trying to obtain some of the stimulus funding that might be available in this respect. Uh, but the state government really needs to step up as well. Uh, if, if they can uh, find the money in the short term to provide housing and accommodation, um, then I think it's not reasonable for them to put people out, to kick people out onto the street after this immediate crisis is over. So, um, uh, look, thank you, Councillor Shree, for the question. I can't speculate on what the state government might do um, when the current arrangements come to an end, but uh, you have raised a legitimate issue. It is a legitimate issue uh, and one that I share your concern about uh, because we do need to uh, make sure that all three levels of government are working together on, on the issue of homelessness. Uh, and hopefully we can get some good funding um, from uh, you know, the federal and state governments to help deal with the supply of that social and affordable housing. So, um, look, I, like I said, I can't speculate on what might happen, but we are working uh, to make sure that there is funding granted to the needs of homelessness, uh, not only in Brisbane, but the capital cities of Australia that um, are suffering uh, from significant problems, particularly uh, in, the, in the case that if you look at the um, discussions we've had with other uh, Lord Mayors, it's interesting. Some of the states have done what Queensland has done, uh, which is to provide that um, temporary accommodation during COVID. Um, some have not, but uh, we know that, um, you know, a place like Melbourne and Sydney, uh, a similar thing is happening. What's the, what's the next step? What's the next step? That's a legitimate question. Uh, we don't want to see people being thrown out um, of accommodation when they're in desperate need of it. So uh, thank you, Councillor Shree, for raising the question. You have raised and highlighted a, a very legitimate issue. Further questions, Councillor Hutton. My question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin, as the works on Kingsford Smith Drive near completion, can you update the Chamber on the facts of this vital infrastructure project, including your response to the continued misrepresentations by the Labor Party about the delivery of this project? Councillor McLaughlin. In a chair, Mills. Uh, through you, Mr Chair, thank you for your question, Councillor Hutton, no, uh, and for the opportunity to provide an update on this critically needed project that's future-proofing our city and transforming one of Brisbane's most significant transport corridors built in horse and cart days to cope with the uh, citywide needs of the 21st century. Uh, the River Road, as it was called, was built to provide a connection through to the 19th century convict era women's prison at Eagle Farm and now called Kingston Smith Drive. Beneath the road surface is a complex network of public utility services, including power, water supply, gas, telecommunications and wastewater infrastructure that service not only the immediate area, but uh, Brisbane more broadly. And upgrading these services is the sort of work I'm referring to when I talk about this as a future proofing project, more, much more than a congestion busting project that's ensuring that road, public transport and utility infrastructure will be able to service the future needs of Brisbane. Uh, Mr Chair, current works are stabilising the rock face on the outbound lanes over time. The rock walls on the northern verge that were excavated nearly 200 years ago have been destabilised by vegetation and work is reducing future risk of erosion and rockfall. Uh, new road pavements and asphalt laying is also underway as well as the construction of new curb and footpaths, installation of street lights and landscaping works. Finished works include the Loris Bonney Riverwalk, Brett's Wharf Plaza, Cameron Rock's War Memorial Precinct, and all the roads 
all the roadworks to the east of Harbour Road. The project is on track to be finished in the second half of this year within the contracted budget. And I'll repeat that again through you, Mr Chair, for the benefit of the Leader of the Opposition. KSD is on track to be completed this year within the contracted budget. The Leader of the Opposition attempted in the third budget review debate I hear an interjection in the third budget review debate um, to yeah, yeah. negative spin a clearly marked amount of $17 million that was brought forward from next year's budget to the current financial year, not an extra cost as was claimed. So through you, Mr Chair, Councillor Cassidy either doesn't know how to read the budget papers, and that's certainly noted for future reference, or chooses to ignore the truth in the interest of continuing his pre-election propaganda. And Mr Chair, businesses in the area are reaping the benefit of the completed works, particularly in the industrial and commercial areas of the Australia Trade Coast. For example, a story in the Courier Mail last week, and I know the Leader of the Opposition won't acknowledge this story. Uh, I'll ho hold it up. It was in, oh, you can't really see it, but I'll quote from it. A story in the Courier Mail last week um, reports on a Sunshine Coast cabinet manufacturer relocating its warehouse and distribution headquarters in the Australia Trade Coast to take advantage of the precinct's significant upgraded roads, of which Kingsford Smith Drive is the main artery. The article highlights how the Trade Coast precinct serves as an area of high demand for industrial uses, given its location close to the port, airport and CBD. Uh, Mr Chair, the article says, and I'll quote from it, the extensive upgrades that have been undertaken to the road network have resulted in an area that allows major occupiers to access arterial networks in all directions with ease. This road access was of major importance to the manufacturer who can have multiple truck movements between their Sunshine Coast manufacturing facility and Pink and Bar daily, end quote. Mr Chair, this is one example of how the Kingston Smith Drive upgrade is supporting the future of our city. Now more than ever, we need projects like this that are not only generating jobs by virtue of the work itself, but supporting job creation in the coming years. The Trade Coast, Port of Brisbane and Brisbane Airport precinct are set to become South East Queensland's second biggest employment generator, expected to support 33,000 jobs and 25% of Brisbane's export growth over the next 20 years. Mr Chair, I'm proud that the Kingston Smith Drive upgrade is providing vital connections in this, to this precinct and ultimately helping to keep jobs and growth in the city's industrial sector. Of course, the Leader of the Opposition doesn't care about jobs and growth in our city. The Leader of the Opposition only denigrates job generating projects and disrespects the workers slogging it out every day to help make a better Brisbane. Thank you, Mr Chair. That concludes question time. Councillors, I draw your attention to the uh, committee reports the Establishment and Coordination Committee report, please, the Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, I move the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 1st of June, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the... <clears throat> Excuse me, moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting that at Monday the 1st of June 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate for the Lord Mayor? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Look, we've seen some interesting things already uh, in this meeting happening. Um, we heard uh, a question from the Leader of the Opposition um, about CBIC. Um, and one, one question which really uh, is a fascinating insight into the way uh, Labor councillors and the Labor opposition seems to view uh, financial matters uh, because um, Councillor Cassidy may not be aware of the history, but uh, his suggestion that by paying rent, council paying rent to CBIC, this was some kind of problem, um, it, it's quite fascinating. This, this sort of suggestion, the implication in his question. So let's go into a little bit of history about council facilities and who owns them and whether we rent or own or buy, uh, because there's a building right behind City Hall that currently Telstra is in. 
um, and it was previously called the Brisbane Administration Centre. That building was owned by the Brisbane City Council and therefore by the ratepayers of Brisbane. Under Labor, that building was sold. It was sold uh, for $35 million at the time. And then uh, the Labor Council at the time decided that they would spend over $30 million fitting out and renting um, Brisbane Square. Now the $30 million was just for the initial fit out and then there was uh, many millions uh, in rent paid each year for Brisbane Square. So that is obviously the building where many of our council offices are in at the moment. So under Labor, it was okay to sell an existing council asset and move into a rented asset and to spend almost most, most as much on fitting out the rented asset as you received in the sale proceeds for a CBD building. And then on top of that, pay millions and millions of dollars each year to a private investor. That was okay for Labor, but apparently what is not okay now is for us to pay rent to a council investment fund, which then in turn provides a dividend back to us. Just consider that for a moment. So it's okay to provide rent to a investor where we get nothing else in return for it other than the right to be in the building. Yet somehow Labor thinks it's not a good deal if we pay rent to ourselves or a council owned investment fund and then get something back at the end of that. Wow, this is why Labor should never run a $3.1 billion budget in the city of Brisbane uh, because they can't get that basic financial concept that uh, if you're renting off the city of Brisbane Corporation, city of Brisbane Investment Corporation, and then there's money coming back from that to council to support uh, the Green Future Fund, then that is a good thing, not a bad thing. But then we saw in the meeting some other things, interesting things happen. True to form, the Labor councillors will do and say anything to defend the indefensible. They will do and say anything to support their Labor colleagues in George Street. Consider for a moment that it was an LNP state government that was jacking up the bulk water charge, which then got passed on to residents, businesses and sporting clubs. Do you think Labor councillors would have taken the same approach? I think we all know the answer to that question. Uh, but the reality is uh, this opposition will simply fall into line with their colleagues in George Street on every important matter. And we saw another example of that with the allocation of funding this week. So not only have they refused to defend the people of Brisbane, the sporting clubs, the businesses, the residents, the householders who are getting hit with a 3.5% increase in their bulk water charges at a time when the council owned water retailer is freezing charges. So on the one hand, you have councils retailer freezing charges and the state government jacking them up by three and a half percent. But yet at the same time, you have a state government and a minister for local government uh, that deliberately, deliberately denied funding to Brisbane residents to send that money elsewhere in Queensland. Yet the Labor Party will not stand up and defend the people of Brisbane. They will only defend their own colleagues. They will only fall into line and fight to defend their own colleagues, not for the people of Brisbane, not for the unemployed people of Brisbane who deserve funding to support local projects and jobs, not for the sporting clubs of Brisbane who are getting hit with a bigger bill, a water bill as a result of the Labor state government jacking up uh, the price of bulk water, yet they will only defend their own party. We will stand up for the people of Brisbane when it is right to do so. And I think the best example that you can point to was during the um, bus network review. Uh, now, some councillors were here, some councillors weren't, but this was an LNP state government proposing uh, bus network changes, which we believed as a council 
people are not beneficial to the people of Brisbane. We stood up, even though it was a government of the same colour as ours, and we defended our residents. We did the right thing and we had a stoush. And I've got to say, there are some people uh, who still in our own party haven't forgiven us for that, but we did the right thing. And the contrast is clear. Labor will always defend their labor mates over the people of Brisbane. Uh, we will stand up for the sporting clubs and the residents and the businesses, uh, and we will do the right thing. We can't fix every problem here, but we will provide the targeted support where it makes a difference. Uh, just as we provided support uh, late last year when sporting clubs were experiencing drought, uh, they were experiencing incredible drought. We had many, many months of little or no rainfall. We gave them support. And now as they're experiencing COVID, uh, we have given them support. And we have given them support through responsible financial management, by finding savings elsewhere in the budget, uh, by taking funding from projects that either have been delayed or cannot go ahead uh, due to COVID, uh, and making sure that money gets targeted to support the community and sporting clubs that are in need. And I can say next week in the budget, there will be further support as well. Uh, so we wanna do everything we can to provide support to those in need, uh, and we can do that through responsible financial management. We will continue to do that. Uh, Mr. Chair, as I usually do, um, I just wanted to give you an update on the lining up of council assets. Uh, this coming Saturday will mark 30 years of the MS Brizzy to the Bay bike ride. Uh, this well-known bike ride supports the work of MS Queensland which aims to help people living with multiple sclerosis uh, to get the best of life and to advocate for change and to search for a cure. Uh, while the ride unfortunately can't proceed this year, uh, the MS Brizzy to the Bay is going virtual with a 30 for 30 challenge. They're asking participants to set yourself up challenge to complete in the next 30 days um, to show our support, the Victoria Bridge and the Story Bridges will be lit red and blue on Saturday. On Sunday and Monday, the Victoria and Story Bridges will be lit in purple to support World Elder Abuse Week. Uh, well, not Elder Abuse Week, Elder Abuse Awareness Week, um, which is uh, important. Uh, the Elder Abuse Prevention Unit, um, supported by Uniting Care Queensland, uh, works in the prevention of elder abuse, as well as uh, providing the helpline and supports community education as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, the items in front of us, uh, item A uh, is a um, dedication, uh, effectively to support the dedication of road reserve um, as a result of the inner city bypass upgrade that we completed in late 2018. Uh, obviously, um, the widening of the inner city bypass has uh, created a need to update our records um, to dedicate this uh, 395 square meters uh, as road reserve, which reflects what it is at the moment. Um, so this is the tidying up of that process. Uh, and item B is uh, the contracts and tendering report for April. Uh, there's a number of projects uh, that um, are worthy of mention in this particular uh, contracts and tendering report, um, but the work goes on to upgrade uh, our facilities and provide okay. important upgrades okay. where we Time has expired. Extension. Thank Extension of time moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, all those in favour say aye. And raise your hand. Thank aye. you. Aye. No, and raise your hand. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a number of notable projects uh, in the uh, list. Point of order, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, um, for many years, uh, the chair of this council, including yourself, has been very strict about breaks for the purpose of relieving the clerks. Um, and I note that in recent weeks, since we've been doing Zoom meetings, um, we have not been abiding by those in the afternoon or the evening. Um, can you advise why the change, given the purpose of the breaks, has always been to give the clerks a break? Councillor Johnson, are you moving the motion to go to tea? 
I'm, I'm seeking some advice from you as the presiding officer about why there's been a change to the procedure in this place um, yes, and why I, we're not doing what we normally do. I always take, uh, I always take um, the uh, resolution as presented. So I don't insist that it be strictly at four. I accept the resolution when it arrives. And at the moment, uh, and nor has it ever been in my experience that a resolution of that nature would occur during a speech or presentation by a councillor. Okay, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. I will, uh, I will be brief, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, some of the uh, note noteworthy projects, uh, the um, Shellgate Street Bridge replacement and the Tallerwood Place Bridge replacement, uh, the, there's access and inclusion works going on. Uh, the Kangaroo Point Cliffs Park Early Works, Murray Recreation Reserve Early Works, um, the decking supply for the Cultural Centre Riverwalk. Our uh, councillors would be aware, uh, this section of the Riverwalk, very well used, um, but um, some issues with the decking uh, that have existed for a long time. Obviously, the standards that we have now for the construction of Riverwalk uh, are very different than the standards that existed when that cultural centre section of Riverwalk um, was built. Um, and so we're taking the opportunity to, to do some important works on that section of Riverwalk uh, and to put a new surface on. Uh, this is the surface, um, and Councillor Murphy, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that has uh, wooden panels. Um, and it's also a surface that from time to time gets inundated um, with high tides and river flooding. Uh, so we'll be obviously replacing uh, that river walk surface. Um, and Wagner's um, have, uh, sorry, uh, not Wagner's, um, uh, Newbow uh, have um, won the tender for that work, uh, which, is, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, then there's the commercial road and Doggett Street intersection upgrade. I was out there uh, just a matter of days ago to have a look at the work um, going on at that location. Obviously a, a very busy intersection in Newstead, uh, a lot of traffic. Um, and this is one of the projects funded as part of the Better Roads for Brisbane program, uh, which is a joint federal council investment of $500 million of upgrades across the suburbs of Brisbane. This is the first cab off the rank. Works are well underway on that upgrade and looking forward to, be, uh, to seeing that completed uh, later on this year. There's also the disinfecting and sanitising of our bus fleet, which is something that we were able to gear up very quickly as a result of COVID uh, and something that occurs at all seven depots every night. Uh, I had the pleasure of um, visiting the Carina depot uh, in recent times with Wolfgang and uh, we saw firsthand the sanitising work that goes on and the process to, to clean, thoroughly clean each uh, bus every night. Uh, and there is a big team of people out there working uh, to keep our uh, traveling passengers safe, our bus drivers safe, uh, and uh, people that work on the buses as well, uh, safe as well. So there's a great effort going on there, but you can see that's a, a major uh, exercise each night, seven depots, 1200 plus buses being sanitized to keep Brisbane people safe. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll leave my uh, comments at that and um, welcome a debate on these two items. Further speakers? Point of order, Chair. Landers. Point of order to you, Council Landers. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have left the meeting. I've got a motion uh, moved by Council Landers, seconded by Council Hutton, that this Council adjourn for the purpose of afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the meeting. All those in favour say aye and hold up your hand. Thank aye. You. You can say no and hold up your hand. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. We'll see you in a moment. So.
Welcome back, councillors. Are there any further speakers? I'm not there yet. All right, now I am. Please, someone has their microphone on. Yeah, Please. I do. Yep. No, Councillor Cassidy, I've called, I have called you. Oh, thank you. I didn't hear you, Chair. Thanks. Um, uh, I'm speaking on both these items and just ask that uh, they be taken seriatim for voting purposes, please. Items A and B taken seriatim for voting. Yes, thank you. So on um, Clause A, um, the surrender of the trusteeship um, for uh, seven, uh, sorry, 271 Gilchrist Road, Hurston, um, which is the parcel of land that was impacted on by the ICB upgrade, which was completed um, in November 2018. Um, the decision will formally surrender the land uh, from Victoria Park um, to Road Reserve, um, which has already happened in practice, uh, given the work's already done. So we don't have any issues, um, given we supported that project with um, these changes being made in terms of paperwork. Uh, on Clause B, the contracts and tendering um, for April 2020, um, I'm quite amazed that um, after a number of weeks um, of pushing the Lord Mayor to provide more information uh, on this item that he has finally started doing so. Uh, so I'll cover off on some of those that he has mentioned. Um, but we um, still have a number of questions concerning these contracts, Chair. So before us today, there's 12, uh, ticking off $8.4 million in public spending for April 2020. Um, again, I went up to level 23. Um, to the very helpful um, uh, committee uh, staff that were up there and uh, checked out the files. And again, there's no additional information about any of these projects uh, whatsoever on the on the file there. So um, I will deal with some of the information the Lord Mayor did provide and hopefully chairs will be able to provide uh, information throughout the debate. But I do want to be clear, uh, Chair, just because we, the, the Labor team in, in Council, has questions about some of these contracts or about the process in which these contracts come to council and the lack of information doesn't mean we don't support uh, some of the items in here um, at all. Uh, uh, these contracts, as is the case each and every month, are voted on a um, in a block rather than individually. So uh, we, if we want to support, for instance, chair uh, contracts for access and inclusion, but oppose the quarter of a million dollars for market research, we can't do so individually. Um, so uh, I just want to make that absolutely clear for councillors in the chamber. Uh, and it's simple that there is a lack of information provided to councillors who um, are expected to come to these meetings uh, and vote on these items and approve the decisions of council's delegates who are not elected um, representatives uh, of the people of Brisbane. We are. Uh, they are making the decision to spend this money and we are here to make a decision whether we uh, endorse that spending or not. So in terms of finding out information for our residents, the ones we represent, and more broadly the residents around Brisbane, on contract one, the City of Lights Bud Lighting Design Supply and Installation, which is a $320,000 contract, uh, we'd like to know where these lights are being installed, which precincts uh, they will be going up uh, in, and whether they have already been installed uh, given this is a contract uh, from April, and if not, when will they be installed? Um, we uh, have some questions about the asbestos remediation works at Grinstead Park and Nogra um, in, in your ward uh, chair, a $1.4 million project. Um, that is a fairly significant remediation project. So some, some information about uh, what works are occurring as part of that uh, would be uh, appreciated. Is that the um, entirety of the project or is that simply part of the project? Uh, the Lord Mayor mentioned uh, the uh, Shellgate Bridge Replacement at West Chermside uh, and Tallowood Place Bridge Replacement at Bridgman Downs, although he just mentioned them. Uh, there's a million dollars for these works. Uh, it says in the contracts document that the price has been normalised due to uh, delay costs. Uh, so we would like to know what are these costs and what are the delays? Have they now been overcome? And are this, is this project now proceeding um, as normal and why did the delays occur um, uh, in this contract? Uh, contract for access and inclusion uh, package one for 2019-2020. Uh, um, we support this program and always have um, and these initiatives, but there's no information on um, the contract. It's probably, uh, we assume from the funding, a refit or a fit out um, of, a, of a facility. Is it for one project or many projects, Chair, is a question we have, and, and what is the nature of the work that is being undertaken? 
Our contracts five, six, and seven uh, all appear to be landscaping projects at Chermside Hills, Kangaroo Point Cliffs, and Murray Recreational Reserve. The, the Lord Mayor mentioned those. Um, it is significant um, landscaping works so at $1.2 million for these contracts. So what is being undertaken um, at these? Uh, the Lord Mayor did um, detail um, contract eight, the decking for the Cultural Centre Riverwalk. Um, so that's great to know. Our contract nine uh, is almost $2.3 million for the safety upgrade of Commercial Road and Dogger Street. The Lord Mayor mentioned uh, this is one of the uh, federally funded um, upgrades, uh, road projects, and uh, there are no specifics on this file, uh, but according to the council website, uh, it's focused on improving pedestrian safety at that intersection. So we, of course, are supportive of initiatives which uh, improve pedestrian safety. We'd like to see more of an emphasis uh, in our outer suburbs, not just inner city areas. Uh, this is, as the Lord Mayor mentioned, one of those projects that the, the federal government announced they were funding um, I'm not sure when we're going to see uh, details of other projects that this funding was supposed to um, uh, provide uh, works for, particularly those ones out at Bracken Ridge. And I'm sure Council Landers will be uh, all across that, uh, particularly Norris Road, those series of intersection upgrades that were supposed to have been undertaken uh, a considerable time ago. Uh, contract 10 is for the disinfection uh, and sanitisation of Brisbane's bus fleet during COVID-19. Absolutely has our full support. Um, keeping commuters and bus drivers safe during the um, health pandemic uh, is paramount. So um, uh, doing this work is, is, is absolutely important and can't, we could never afford the risk of transmission uh, of COVID-19 um, on our public transport network. The successful tenderer, uh, Multana, property, Multana, or Multana Property Services is an Indigenous business providing training and job opportunities for Australia's uh, First Nations people. Um, uh, and interestingly, uh, something the Lord Mayor didn't mention, but the name of that organisation uh, means coming together to help each other in the um, Kalkadoon language spoken in and around the Mount Isa region. So it's a, certainly a fantastic organisation for Council uh, to be supporting and, and we support contracts going to organisations like these who are creating uh, jobs and training opportunities for, um, uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. But again, having that information at hand um, would be very useful for councillors coming into this place and uh, approving these significant contracts. Uh, contract 11 is nearly $200,000 for um, uh, a construction project management software. Um, we you know, would like to know which construction projects this is going to be affecting. You can certainly hope that it would be um, to rein in some of the cost blowouts we're seeing on projects like Kingston Smith Drive or on Brisbane Metro. Um, we'd like to know more about this software um, before we are voting on these items. Uh, and, uh, of course, last but not least is contract 12, um, which is um, the item for around a quarter of a million dollars being awarded, um, but this is a I'm portion of $7 million, $7 million um, uh, in total, uh, which is a million dollars a year for the total of this contract on market research. Now, given the millions of dollars that the Lord Mayor spends on um, bossy uh, living in Brisbane, self-promotion flyers and the millions of dollars of ratepayers' money wasted on the Brisbane ads. Um, we are concerned about this contract and are always concerned about uh, this type of money being spent on market research without any detail as to what uh, is being done uh, with these contracts. So um, unlike the Lord Mayor, we don't think a quarter of a million dollars of market research is actually small change. Uh, we have... Um, questions about this and the answers can't be found on uh, on the ENC files. Uh, for example, where are the projects, um, uh, um, sorry, what were the projects for, essentially what was being tested and what research was being um, conducted, what messages were being tested in focus groups, we can imagine. How many market research projects were uh, we getting for the $250,000 in total? Um, who was involved in the research? Were they... Um, simply residents of Brisbane? Were they organisations within Brisbane? Um, were they for specific projects or were they for overall branding uh, and messaging in the lead up um, to the last council election? Um, were they done as surveys, polls? Were they done as face-to-face -face, um, or over Zoom um, market research sessions? So there is a lot of information that councillors do require before we make um, a judgment on awarding these or approving these con uh, contracts that have already been 
um, awarded, particularly um, items like the $7 million on market research. Uh, so without this information being provided each month, Chair, um, and these items being voted on as a block, while we support some of these wholeheartedly, um, we can't act as a rubber stamp for this administration. Yep. Thanks, Cassidy, Chair. your time has expired. Uh, Thanks. Do you want an extension? No. Further speakers? Yeah, Councillor uh, Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. I rise to speak briefly to item B with regard to the contract for the replacement of the Shellgate Street Bridge in Chermside West uh, and the Tellerwood Place Bridge in Bridgman Downs. Uh, Mr Chair, since the 1960s, the current timber bridge well, the current timber pedestrian bridge at Shellgate Street has served the community well. Uh, it's provided connectivity across a drainage channel uh, on Melaleuca Green along Downfall Creek between Shellgate uh, Street and Kinnerton Street, uh, but it also leads to a playground on Melaleuca Green. Uh, but, you know, 50 years on, the bridge has reached the end of its serviceable life. The new bridge will be a 3.6 metre wide steel bridge with a concrete deck which will be safer and more accessible for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, and that's really important at the moment because with more and more people out and about using the local network of bikeways and pathways, the new bridge will be an important piece of infrastructure that will not only offer pedestrian access, uh, but will be designed uh, for other forms of active uh, transport, including cycling and scootering. Uh, Mr Chair, uh, this week I uh, caught up with uh, some long-time locals, uh, June and Graham, uh, who came to see me about uh, the new bridge. And this lovely couple has been uh, living uh, near Melaleuca Green uh, for, for some time uh, and they used the bridge on their daily walk and so they were very interested, of course, on the progress of this replacement piece of infrastructure. Uh, like many young couples in the 1960s, they decided uh, on the outer northern suburbs uh, to build their new home. Uh, and uh, that was part of the housing estates that sat alongside uh, Melaleuca Green, that is off Kinnerton Street and uh, Shellgate Street. Uh, they moved into their new home in 1965 and uh, they were telling me that they recall the bridge being built a few years later. Um, the Tallerwood Bridge, uh, the Tallerwood uh, Place Bridge is an important link across Cabbage Tree Creek between Coolabar Crescent and uh, Jim Wilding Reserve. Uh, the existing build, bridge was built in uh, 1998 uh, and the new bridge will be replaced with a new 3.1 metre wide steel and concrete bridge. Uh, Mr Chair, uh, local residents love our little part of Brisbane. Um, we love it because of the parks and the open spaces and, of course, the connected active transport, transport networks where you can take your kids for a walk, you can take your dogs for a walk, uh, you can run, you can ride your bikes and just actually enjoy the great Brisbane outdoor lifestyle that we have. Um, I'm looking forward very much to the new bridges uh, at Shellgate Street and at Tallerwood Place. Uh, both bridges will absolutely enhance our active transport routes and uh, just more examples of how this administration is investing in the right sort of infrastructure to get uh, residents home quicker and safer uh, with improved active transport options um, as part of our growing network of safe, uh, convenient and connected pathways and bikeways. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I rise to speak on items A and uh, B. Uh, firstly, just with respect to item A briefly, it's really disappointing to see um, what is the formalisation of the loss of part of Victoria Park. Um, this is one of this is Brisbane's oldest park, and it is really, really sad to see that it continues to be carved up. I've spoken on this um, when other projects have chopped chunks of it off. Um, and it's it's disappointing to see um, uh, that being formalised in item A here uh, before us today. Um, it is item B, however, that I would like to speak on. And uh, like Councillor Cassidy, it's contract 12 um, that is of concern. Now, we've heard uh, today from the LNP councillors about, um, and I quote, the significant investment they're making in clubs um, through water rebates. 
um, five thousand uh, dollars in the latest announcement by the Lord Mayor for 150 clubs. It's, I don't know about seven hundred thousand dollars, I think. Um, let's compare that what the LNP describe as a significant investment with the amount that they're going to spend on market research. So um, the contract approved under the leadership of this Lord Mayor uh, is for $7 million uh, over a potential seven-year term. So we don't know if that's how many add-ons and extensions there might be. Um, but this council's going to divide $7 million, so that's about a million dollars a year, more, more on doing surveys and ringing residents and annoying them at night um, than they're going to spend on investing in supporting our sporting and community clubs. Now, <clears throat> Councillor Hammond got all upset earlier today when people were sort of critical of um, the meagre investment that this administration had made in sporting clubs. Um, and this is exactly why. Um, more than anything else on the agenda um, in this item, does this demonstrate um, the wrong priorities that this administration has? Now, I know that the Lord Mayor is going to come back with his uh, earnest, um, uh, you know, but uh, very pedantic uh, explanation of we always do the survey. Well, we don't really need to do it. We could let it go for a year or two and redirect that money into um, other priorities, given there's a global pandemic that is having a massive impact on the budget. Um, did anybody in a senior leadership position, say the Lord Mayor or the Deputy Mayor, who's probably in charge of all of this as part of economic development or even the CEO, um, you know, I, he knows big numbers. He's very familiar with big numbers. Um, maybe, maybe somebody in a leadership position or Councillor Allen. I mean, the new finance chair, surely he's had a look at this and gone, shit. Oh, uh, sorry, shish, uh, $7 million. That is a lot of money to be spending on uh, market research. Um, I think it is just disgusting. And normally I vote for, even when I um, don't agree with everything the administration is doing, I always vote for contracts and tendering because this is the uh, administration that's been elected to run the city. However, there are no circumstances under which in the current financial climate that I am going to support this administration spending $7 million on market research, $7 million on market research while residents are struggling, small businesses are struggling. I've got footpaths that have been on waiting lists for six or seven years. Uh, I, we've got clubs that are struggling. Um, and yet this administration is prepared to spend $7 million um, on marketing, on surveys, um, ringing people at night and annoying them. Um, and, and here are the companies that have been awarded uh, this largesse. Uh, Shotler Consulting, Colmar Brunton, the Lab Insight and Strategy Brisbane, Nature as trustee for Nature Unit Trust and Ipsos Public Affairs. Now, oh, sorry, one more, Q&A Market Research uh, Services. So this council's got a list of uh, research companies. Presumably, we don't know what they're going to do with this money, but presumably they're going to put their ideas out there and then go out in the background and market test them and check that what the Lord Mayor is doing actually reflects what the people of Brisbane want. Early well, I can tell you... Election. Yeah. I can tell you now that the people of Brisbane do not want $7 million spent on market research. The big problem with the way the Lord Mayor is running um, this city and the CEO and the finance chairman and the deputy mayor is they keep telling us that there have been financial impacts uh, to the budget because of the global pandemic, but we're not seeing um, adjustments to our expenditure 
um, that could reasonably assist in mitigating the adverse impacts of the financial uh, impacts of COVID-19 um, on residents. Instead, we're seeing extraordinary largesse, $7 million that this administration is going to spend on navel gazing. Now, it could go into clubs. Let's remember um, that the LNP, Councillor Adams, Councillor Hammond and others today stood up and said what a significant investment they were making in sporting clubs um, with the $5,000 water grant. Um, that's less than a million dollars, less than one million. It's only about $700,000 that they're going to spend. Yet they're prepared to back, defend and say that this $7 million of expenditure is appropriate in the current circumstances, is a good use of ratepayers' Um, uh, ratepayers' uh, payments uh, to the council is a good thing in the current circumstances? Well, I do not believe it is. This is a massive waste of money. It is completely unnecessary. And the council is not going to grind to a halt because we stopped doing market research for a year or two and redirect those millions of dollars into um, expenditure that will assist the residents of Brisbane, the businesses of Brisbane and the clubs of Brisbane to cope with the impacts of COVID-19. This is not a good use of money. This is an appalling waste of money. Um, and it just shows the level of hypocrisy by the LNP councillors who want to stand up and take credit for spending less than a seventh of uh, the same amount of money on sporting clubs and say how fantastic that is, but they want to spend $7 million on navel gazing, um, seeking self-approval, uh, and that is just unacceptable in the current financial environment. Um, so as I said at the beginning of this item, I normally support um, the contracts and tendering, um, as I have done for many years. I will not be today. Um, this the decision to progress this um, expenditure uh, just should never have happened. Um, this just clearly shows that the leadership of this council, the Lord Mayor, the Deputy Mayor, the Finance Chair and the CEO are asleep at the wheel when they let $7 million of expenditure roll through that could otherwise be directed to more important priorities around this city, which include managing the impacts of COVID-19 or just doing anything actually useful, like building some safer pedestrian crossings, fixing bikeways, um, improving parks facilities. You know, we've got residents who are out in the suburbs more than ever and we're not seeing that additional investment needed out there. So um, this, this demonstrates today to me that this administration are absolutely delusional about how to spend money in the best, most effective way to support Brisbane residents and I will not support the expenditure of $7 million for market research and exercise in navel gazing when Brisbane residents businesses and clubs are doing it so tough. It's the wrong decision. Further speakers? Councillor Atwood. Councillor Atwood, your microphone, please. Apologies. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on item B, the Murray Recreation Reserve, a home to the Balmoral Cycling Club and arguably the best skate park in Dogway Ward. The Murray Recreation Reserve was once a tip for, for Brisbane's eastern suburbs and closed in 1975. Council's first stage of recycling the area into a recreational facility came about for the 1982 Commonwealth Games where Brisbane saw 36 competitors from 15 nations participate in a four-day archery tournament. Now, the overall vision for the Murray Recreation Reserve now is to build the best cycling facility in southeast Queensland with something for everyone. And I think that the positioning for this upgrade couldn't be better with direct access to the Murray train station across the road from the Cannon Hill Bus Interchange along Wynnum Road and only eight kilometres from the Chandler Velodrome. But back to the master plan. After hearing extensive feedback from various cycling stakeholders, 
other local sporting clubs, including rollerblading groups and other members of our community on what they would like to see. I am very excited to see this master plan come together. To improve the facilities for cyclists, Council would like to upgrade the 1.4 kilometre criterion to a two kilometre closed circuit criterion, bringing it into line with other racing tracks across the globe and add an um, open pavilion for cyclists to warm up, official starting line with a podium, lighting to make the most of this terrific facility and fencing to help protect cyclists and park users. These upgrades will allow Brisbane to chase world-class cycling events and bring, bring more business to Brisbane. To also help foster their junior program, the council are looking to build a learn to ride circuit, a smaller loop off the criterium, uh, a pump track next to the skate park, and this will create a kid's teen area away from the main criterium. While this master plan is still underway and may see some changes, upgrades to the Vicky Wilson playground have started. Now this upgrade isn't just your run of the mill playground. It has a real focus on something for everyone. And as a mum who spends a lot of time at our playgrounds, I am very excited about the parents and guardians nook with an adult swing set. More uh, picnic playgrounds and shelters, barbecue facilities and a different play areas for various age groups. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of the council officers involved, especially Helena, who has helped bring this vision for our community to life. And I can't wait for this project to come to fruition. Thank you. Further speakers? I see no hands. I call on the Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just briefly, uh, thank you to the councillors um, who contributed to the uh, debate uh, or discussion. Um, and uh, I um, would simply point out that Councillor Johnson appears to have watched that movie Austin Powers a few too many times um, because she quoted a number again and again, uh, which simply is not a reflection of reality. Uh, what we are seeing here is a continuation of existing arrangements. Um, and if you look very clearly, um, the document in front of us uh, shows that it is a, a three-year arrangement uh, which sets upper limits, but that doesn't mean that that's- Seven what million. Doesn't mean that that is what will be spent. Seven million. Uh, please allow the Lord Mayor to be heard in silence. Lord Mayor. It uh, doesn't mean that that's what will be spent. Uh, we will uh, ensure that the level of expenditure is appropriate for the times. Um, but this is a arrangement that goes well beyond uh, the period of COVID. Um, and uh, we will make sure that we continue to do what we can to support our community in its time of need. Uh, it is very easy for Councillor Johnston to pluck a figure out and say, oh, well, you know, what would uh, what, what else you, would you be able to do with that money? Well, it costs, um, and I'm speaking from memory here, what it costs about about $20 million a year. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted, Lord Mayor. It costs well over $20 million a year just to have councillors in Brisbane City Council. Um, you know, democracy comes at a cost. Uh, we could easily uh, we could easily argue if you're using Councillor Johnson's logic that Council, Brisbane City Council can do without the cost of having councillors. Uh, surely um, we could run better without councillors. Uh, no, um, the reality is council will continue uh, to be a good, responsible, democratic manager of our city, providing guidance and leadership um, during a time of critical importance to the people of Brisbane. Uh, and that, uh, that means that we will cut the cloth to measure when it comes to our expenditure. And the items in front of us are no different. They are no different. And so I'd simply reject what Councillor Johnston was saying about a level of expenditure. That is not what will be spent. Uh, that is uh, simply an upper limit over a seven year period. Uh, and um, the initial term is only for three years. So uh, we will uh, spend 
a, a responsible level um, in a time when our community needs it. Um, and just because Councillor Johnston says that council will be spending a certain amount of money, I caution uh, anyone who's listening um, with the advice that that is not the case. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, uh, Councillor Johnston, you had a misrepresentation. Um, please uh, limit your, con your comments to the misrepresentation at hand, Councillor Johnston. Yes, the Lord Mayor has claimed that I plucked a figure out of the air and the $7 million that is actually in the Council papers, page five, contract 12, Thank you. which is for $7 million. All right, now we will now put these items, item... Point uh, of order, Mr Chairman. So a point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. I would appreciate being able to make my misrepresentation in an appropriate way without you universally just cutting me off. You made your, you made your misrepresentation. No, I did not. You, you had more to add. Well, you cut me off. I would like to make my point of order. You've made it. All right, thank you, councillors. We'll now put... I would uh, like to make my point of order, Mr Chairman. It was a reasonable... I made it in an appropriate way and I would like to make my point of order about misrepresentation without being cut off. You have no. You have made you, you have made your opinion clear. It's uh, not my opinion, uh, Mr. Chairman. I am, I am claiming a point of misrepresentation, and I'm entitled under the meeting's local law to correct it. Uh, Councillor Johnston, I consider that you are displaying unsuitable meeting conduct in accordance with Section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001. I hereby request that you cease speaking over me when I am talking and refrain from exhibiting this conduct. The councillors, item A, all those in favour... Point of I, order, Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. I move dissent in your ruling. There's dissent in my ruling. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Griffiths. Uh, all those who believe, uh, all those who wish to dissent in my ruling, uh, say aye and raise your hands. Aye. 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 Is against, say no and raise your hands. No. The no's have it. All right, now I'll now put division. item A, division called by Councillor Johnston. I see no seconder. Uh, I'll now put item A. All those in favour of item A, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. And those aye. against, please say no and raise your hands. The ayes have it. On item B, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. Okay, please lower your hands. And those against, please say no and raise your hands. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division has been called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Johnston. Please ring the bells. Thank you, Clarks. Please, everybody back. All those in favour, please raise your hand, say aye, and hold your hand in the screen so it may be counted. Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. Please lower your hands. Did you get that? And those against, please say no, raise your hand and hold it there so it may be counted. No. no. Councillor Cumming, you voted both yes and no. Would, could you please indicate verbally which you prefer? No. No, no, no sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, councillors voting no, please hold your hand there that just so it can be counted by the clerks. Thank you. Please lower your hands. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 20 in favour, three against and three abstentions. Thank you. The ayes have it. Councillors, there is a 
uh, second report of the Establishment Coordination Committee, the Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Friday, 5th of June, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. Moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Friday, the 5th of June, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, the Lord Mayor? Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, uh, I seek the following uh, further information with respect to item A. Uh, and I'll just say there's quite a list of things that I am seeking. Firstly, the cost of council's expenditure to date regarding the Metro project, the total cost of the revised Metro project, an explanation of the delays uh, that will arise from the revised Metro project, an explanation about the queuing impacts and the impacts on the Melbourne Grey Street intersection uh, from the revised Metro project, an explanation about why uh, the scramble pedestrian crossing uh, has to be cut from the project at Melbourne Street and Grey Street, and the revised timeframe for delivery of the Metro project. And finally, any changes to the business case that may have been undertaken to support the revised Metro project, if uh, it did indeed uh, have any changes made to it. Thank you, the Lord Mayor. Uh, those uh, questions, um, if time permits, uh, can I encourage you to answer those questions if time permits, please, the Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, before going into the uh, substantive um, item and the nature of what we're talking about here, which is what I referred to in question time, uh, it's important that we get a little bit of history about where we have come to when it comes to uh, public transport in Brisbane and why the, the Metro project is so critical uh, and why uh, we are now proceeding down the path that we are. Now, uh, the history of public transport in Brisbane has been one where uh, the council has consistently stepped up and done uh, more than its fair share of heavy, heavy lifting. And we make no apologies for that. Uh, we uh, certainly aren't complaining about that. We just think it's an important part of the job that we do uh, in providing a better Brisbane. Uh, but the reality is you don't see other councils doing what Brisbane City Council does. You don't see other councils subsidising public transport like we do. Uh, you don't see other tr councils building major transport infrastructure. Uh, and if they do, it might be on a one-off basis as a contribution to a project being done at another level of government. Um, whereas Brisbane City Council leads and delivers major transport infrastructure projects. Uh, and as I said, we do that because it's important for delivering a better Brisbane. The problem of bus congestion uh, in the Brisbane CBD and inner city areas um, is effectively related to the fact that the busway network we have has become the victim of its own success. Uh, the busway network is so popular, uh, it carries, uh, and our bus network as a whole carries far more people than rail carries. And that is uh, uh, different to many cities around the world. Uh, our busway network is effectively uh, the arteries of our public transport network. And uh, we've had a number of uh, projects over the years that have been aimed at uh, trying to free up those arteries, to, clog, to unclog the congestion in those arteries, because unless you do that, you can't put on more public transport services. And so when someone in, in Carindale, someone in Bracken Ridge, someone in various parts of the city says, why can't I have more bus services in my area? Or why can't I have more frequent bus services in my area? Uh, the limitation of our transport network are those bottlenecks that we're seeing um, in parts of the bus network and parts of the busway network. And so freeing up that problem has been the source of our 
our focus for many, many years. And we've consistently come forward with projects that seek to do that, but they have consistently, uh, unfortunately, been shot down uh, by state governments. I'll go back to the uh, suburbs to city bus link project. That was that had a similar intent to Brisbane Metro. Uh, we did the research on the project. We developed uh, a whole lot of work. We went to the state government. The state government said, "No, look, we don't like the design of this bridge that might um, go in front of the Queensland Museum and Art Gallery." Back to the drawing board, and so they, the state government, put the kibosh on that project. Uh, in response to that, an alternative was proposed called the Bat Tunnel, which was uh, a combination of cross river rail with also a bus functionality, bus and train tunnel. And that was designed to solve the dual problems that we're seeing um, Metro and cross river rail looking to solve. Congestion in the busway network, congestion in the rail network. And so work progressed on the Bat Tunnel. We were working cooperatively with the state government and then there was a change of government and the bat tunnel was scuttled. Why? Was it because it was a terrible project? No, because it was an LNP idea and the current Labor government didn't like that idea simply because it wasn't theirs. They then went back to Cross River Rail, which had no improvements whatsoever for the busway network or the bus network. And so instead of a project that would deal with two problems, uh, they went to a project that would deal with one problem, cross river rail. Now that is a real problem and it needs to be solved. Uh, but we are here with Brisbane Metro because the state government would not step up and solve the challenges in the busway network. And it is the third such project that we have put forward to help deal with those issues. And, and what's missing in this whole equation is the state government stepping up to solve the problems in their transport network. Um, rail apparently is the only section of the transport network worthy of a solution, um, yet we acknowledge and understand that um, the busway network carries just as many if not more people each day and is also worthy of a major solution. So summary of, of why Brisbane Metro and why it's so important for our, uh, our public transport network. But it also provides important perspective. When we had a challenge with the state government on the design of the cultural center station, uh, and that was originally proposed as an underground station, uh, I can tell you that I am not going to let Brisbane Metro go the way of the suburbs to city bus link or the Bat Tunnel, which both were scuttled uh, by Labor state governments. Uh, the reality is that we need to get on with Metro because the problem exists now and it will only get worse as the years go on. And so uh, if the Cultural Centre Station was a source of contention and a source of disagreement, then it is the right thing to do to park that decision and move on with the other vital parts of the project uh, that we need to be getting on with. Because the problems in our network won't get less as time goes on, they will get greater. The ability to put on more bus services for the suburbs are dependent on us getting this project going. And so uh, it was the right decision uh, when Councillor Murphy, myself and Minister Bailey met recently and agreed that uh, we would not spend any more time arguing about what the optimum design is for the underground cultural center station uh, but instead we would park that decision and move on with other aspects of the project that uh, are absolutely critical uh, and uh, in doing this uh, we also through our tender process had a number of the tenderers uh, submit um, designs for the improvement of the above ground station at the cultural center. And so uh, this was something that uh, came out of the competitive tender process that we had with three shortlisted tenderers uh, bidding and putting their creative efforts into that bid 
Um, and out of that, I think uh, we have achieved a good outcome, which will see the project going forward, which will see um, at least a decade of life in the above ground upgraded cultural center station. Uh, but having said that, it uh, doesn't jeopardize the potential for an underground station to be built in the future, uh, should the state government decide on what design uh, that they would like or what they would like to do in that respect. Uh, so I will, as I said, not let this project be scuttled because it's very difficult or challenging or com um, complex. It needs to happen. Why? It needs to happen because it's the right thing to do for the people of Brisbane. It needs to happen because it will create jobs and it needs to happen to provide a true turn up and go mass transit system, uh, one that Brisbane deserves. And so, yes, there have been a lot of hurdles put in the way of this project. Yes, it is a very complex project with many moving parts, uh, but we are not deterred by that. Uh, this is a, such an important and good project for our city and I am so delighted now that we have reached agreement with the state government to move forward. So by doing this upgrade to the uh, cultural centre above ground station, uh, continuing ahead with converting the Victoria Bridge to a green bridge, uh, by continuing with uh, the Adelaide Street Tunnel construction, albeit with a different construction methodology, a board tunnel rather than a cut and cover tunnel, uh, we can get on with the major components of this project uh, and creating those jobs that come with it, 2,600 jobs that come with this project. And in the meantime, uh, work continues on the development and construction of the uh, pilot metro vehicle uh, ready for testing next year here in Brisbane, uh, in Brisbane conditions. Uh, once again, something that I'm incredibly excited about. And in the meantime, work continues on... Uh, the mayor, your time has expired. Move for extension. Come by Councillor Adams and seconded by Councillor Landers. All those in favour say aye and raise your hands. Aye. Aye. Thank you. And against no and raise your hands. Thank you. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, it would, it, in, in the meantime, work also continues on the planning of uh, the... Uh, Rochdale Metro Depot as well for a to, to receive a fully electrified fleet. And so this project uh, not only has early works underway, uh, but we have now been given the effective green light for uh, the major works to really gear up. And so it is a very exciting thing. What we are seeing today is an amendment to the significant contracting plan that came to council in 2018. Now, uh, this amendment is effectively to do exactly what I've suggested, which is uh, to put aside discussions and design work on the underground station uh, and to proceed with the upgrading of the above ground station uh, and also uh, the amended components of the project that come with that decision. Uh, I, as I did earlier in question time, want to commend the state government for their approach on this. Obviously, uh, I've made my frustration clear uh, in recent years, uh, but certainly um, the way in which the government has approached this project in recent times uh, is something I am grateful for, but it's also uh, the appropriate thing because the state government knows that this is a good project for Brisbane. The state government knows that they don't have an alternative solution for the bus network problems and the busway problems, uh, and the state government is, while they will never admit this, uh, secretly very grateful that this council is prepared to put in a billion dollars into fixing a problem which is effectively theirs, a problem which they would have to fix if we were uh, stumping up. And so this is a project which delivers a contribution from council and a contribution from the state, uh, federal government towards fixing a state government problem. Uh, but in the end, it is a project which will deliver, deliver benefits across all those three levels of government and benefits, most importantly, to the people of Brisbane who will get that turn up and go transit system. Uh, so uh, the change to the significant contracting plan that we're seeing today, as I mentioned, reflects those changes. Now, Councillor Johnston uh, referred to uh, costs and speculated on costs. Uh, you are not, Councillor Johnston, uh, being asked to prove 
any change to cost as part of this. Out of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yes, um, I'm sure you don't want the Lord Mayor addressing me in the first person, Mr. Chair. Oh, all right. Lord Mayor, through you, you. Chair. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, councillors are not being asked to change to uh, approve a change to the budget of Metro, um, and we're having a budget next week. Uh, and as part of that, in the normal way, there'll be budget information sessions for each program and a a great opportunity to discuss different projects um, and project budgets and, and what uh, that might entail. So that will be coming next week uh, in the budget. But what, they, what we are simply asking people to do today is to update the previous contracting plan, which was approved by council, to reflect the change in scope, to reflect the agreement that we've reached with the state government and to progress this project and create 2,600 jobs uh, and deliver turn up and go public transport for Brisbane residents. So uh, I appreciate the support of the chamber. Uh, I remain ever optimistic and hopeful that we'll get uh, everyone supporting this project. Um, uh, uh, Councillor Cassidy's been smiling, so I know that he's ready to support the project and finally get on board uh, Brisbane Metro, uh, and he'll resist uh, his party political affiliations because guess what? The state government has resisted their party political affiliations to support this project too. Um, so welcome aboard, Councillor Cassidy. Look forward to your support. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Well, thank you very much, Chair. And the Lord Mayor um, always thinks that it's someone else's problem. Uh, he thinks that the bus congestion on the Victoria Bridge is someone else's problem that he is coming in to solve. Well, it's a, it's a problem for the residents of Brisbane. It's a problem for public transport users in Brisbane, uh, and we have consistently said over the last couple of years, just get on with this job. But, Chair, what we see before us today now is the project that we have had to have because we've got uh, Adrian Schrinner as our Mayor. Metro has been exposed uh, for exactly what it is, a great big con job. I remember uh, back in uh, early 2016, uh, the great fanfare when Graham Work and Councillor Schrinner announced this project. That was four and a half years ago. Uh, they told us it would be a grand subway system that would rival Paris or Montreal and be as transformative for Brisbane as the London Tube. The LNP even put out glossy brochures showing us trains in grand red brick underground stations zooming past, and obviously some people believed you at the time. The Lord Mayor doubled down, Chair, uh, and insisted the vehicles would be trains that ran on tracks, thus making this project a metro. Oh, how far Councillor Schrinner has fallen, Chair. Uh, what we have before us today is a very modest busway extension, which is fairly fitting for the sort of administration that Councillor Schrinner runs, Chair. This is the councillor that was responsible for the City Cycle contract which is now $20 million in the red, the IT contract, which is uh, $27 million in the red, the Kingston Smith Drive contract, which is in the red in every sense possible, and now the Brisbane Metro, uh, and we don't even know how much that's going to cost anymore. The original business case told us there were 13 options, Chair, considered for the Brisbane Metro, and this was whittled down to just a handful. All of those options were kept hidden from the people of Brisbane and we still don't know what those options were, uh, why they were considered and why some of them uh, were cast aside. We know that this solution uh, is probably the third or fourth option that was considered, or well, we assume that anyway. This options analysis should now be released for full scrutiny by council and by, by the people of Brisbane. Uh, the LMP simply cannot be trusted to keep this behind closed doors, Chair. The business case that was presented to us all about three years ago said for the princely sum of $944 million, we would be getting a metro system that included a stately underground station at the Cultural Centre and tunnels, lots of tunnels apparently, Chair. Uh, it turns out that that uh, was just a couple of hundred metres of tunnels. Well, today we know that we've got a busway extension from King George Square to North Quay and that's it. Now, that original price of $944 million, Chair, blew out by $100 million uh, on the electric bendy buses, 
and then we know it was going to blow out by at least about another hundred million dollars um, on the Cultural Centre busway station. Uh, this Lord Mayor Chair has fundamentally been caught with his pants down. What is most galling is the fact that this would have been well known before the last election. He kept this one well and truly hidden from the people of Brisbane because he knew this would have been a bigger embarrassment than his KSD blunder chair. You almost feel sorry for this Lord Mayor, except when you consider that this latest redesign was in fact all by design. The project could never have proceeded as planned as long as it remained so fundamentally unplanned. It was born on the back of an envelope chair and apparently hasn't progressed much past that now, despite all the TV ads, despite all the newspaper ads and the glossy brochures. A piece that appeared in the Sunday Mail in May 2018 sums up this whole situation quite nicely, Chair, and I'll quote from some of that. In the middle of an election campaign, the Quirk administration wallpapered Brisbane with glossy brochures touting the Brisbane Metro subway system. They used photos of passengers standing on underground train stations as fast trains zoomed past. They even included a map of Brisbane's new subway. Even this early in the piece, the Lord Mayor must have known he would have come, have to come clean with the people of Brisbane eventually. He knew this project would fundamentally change once it was scrutinised through a business case process, yet he laboured on. Six months later, during the budget debate, he persevered and said, the Brisbane Metro is not a bus, it runs on tracks just like the Paris Metro. That was Councillor Quirk. Then Deputy Mayor Adrian Schrinner doubled down four months later to reaffirm the Brisbane Metro would be an underground rail system. And he said, well, it is a metro, just like the London Underground is a metro and the Tokyo Metro is a metro. So Brisbane was to get a subway like the 400 kilometre long underground in London and the 300 kilometre Tokyo Metro. Fast forward just a few months from those unequivocal comments and the project was totally reborn into a busway extension with some bendy buses, just as Labor had predicted. I hate to be the one to say, I told you so to the Lord Mayor through you, Chair, but I told you so. Today, we're back at square one. This project is being redesigned again with an even smaller busway extension than before. How can we have any confidence that this project will proceed on any sort of budget when it hasn't been able to to date, ever. We're supposed to be blindly trusting this Lord Mayor with over a billion dollars of Brisbane ratepayers' money to come up with new options uh, completely and utterly on the run. We know that um, Spanish company Asiona has recently um, been uh, included in the Brisbane Metro project. That's a company that was associated with the New South Wales Liberal government's a train wreck of a Sydney light rail project, which blew out to more than $3 billion, more than double the project cost. Asiano blamed the Liberal government for misleading it through, get this, poor planning, and the government countered the company was deliberately on a go-slow program. There were billion-dollar lawsuits lodged and a bit of dispute over exactly what was needed to be done and what work needed to be done. Given the continual changes to this metro project, and the specs that are constantly changing, how can we be confident that, that a company like Asiona has been given all the detail they need to carry out this project? Do we know there won't be cost blowouts on the electric buses? Do we know that the electric buses will even work in Brisbane? All of this planning should have been done, Chair, from day one, not started on day 1591. 1,591 days has now passed since the Metro was announced over two elections ago. We have consistently said, as I said at the outset, if you get the planning done right on this project and get on with it. But when this Lord Mayor has attempted that, even when this Lord Mayor has attempted that chair, he has bungled it. We want to see the final cost of this project because if you remove an underground station that is worth hundreds of millions of dollars to the project, uh, it should come a whole lot cheaper. And after poring over the files, there is not one mention of costs involved. So, Chair, in uh, conclusion, we will support this item today, but reserve our final judgment when the costs are presented to Council. But, Chair, um, we've got to say, this Lord Mayor has now been exposed as one of the most ineffectual and inconsequential Lord Mayors this city has ever seen.
Further speakers? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair, and I rise to speak to this submission. We just heard how Councillor Cassidy is not getting on board with Metro, despite his state counterparts finally coming to the party. So now I'll tell him why I think he should get on board. I'm very honoured to speak on this game-changing project as the councillor. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. The claim to be misrepresented. Noted. Councillor Mackay, please continue. I'm very honoured to speak on this game-changing project as the councillor who represents Walter Taylor Ward, which includes the significant UQ St Lucia campus. I believe UQ St Lucia is the largest commuter campus and is second only to the CBD as the second, as the biggest trip generator for our city. The Shaping SEQ Southeast Regional Plan of 2017 tells us that by 2041, Southeast Queensland will be home to nearly 1.9 million extra people. We need to keep pace with that growth and with Metro, we will. Following on from the Lord Mayor's announcement on the 26th of May and on Sunday, I'm very pleased to see another milestone be achieved with the preferred tenderer to be named. The reason that is important is this. Work is now underway to get the awarding of the contract for the works. What a great start to inoculating our city against the economic impacts of the pandemic with some 2,600 jobs that this project will deliver. This submission before us reflects the change to the proposed rollout of the infrastructure works for Brisbane Metro, particularly around the Cultural Centre precinct, with the modelling confirming that at least some years after the Metro comes online and is fully operational, the existing at-grade station can deliver the same performance for Brisbane Metro. For the fine ward of Walter Taylor, Brisbane Metro will provide a service that connects 18 stations along dedicated busways between Eight Mile Plains and Roma Street, including along the Health and Education Corridor between the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital all the way to the University of Queensland Lakes Station. <clears throat> I note the community consultation that was undertaken from 2018 confirmed the strong support from the community for the high frequency turn up and go services that Metro would deliver. Chair, I feel that my colleague, Councillor Shree, might like to ideologically block all vehicles from West End and South Brisbane, but that would cause a problem. Montague Road provides a critical connection for students who use Brisbane City Council buses to get to and from UQ. So I would encourage Councillor Shree to get on board with Metro and not be left at the station. Brisbane Metro is a critical investment in public transport and the students- Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Mackay take a question? No, I won't. No, no, he declines. Councillor Mackay, please continue. Brisbane Metro is a critical investment in public transport and the students and staff of UQ St Lucia campus will know that only too well. Of course, it's not just the students because the residents who live around the massive campus, just a few clicks from the CBD, will have commuter times of just a few minutes to the city. With two bus stations currently on the UQ St Lucia campus, I look forward as the project progresses to find out the detail of how it will work at the UQ Lakes station for Brisbane Metro, as well as the charging station that will need to be there for our fabulous fully electric vehicles, which have, of course, zero tailpipe emissions. These, of course, are to be far better option than the old diesel type engine. The Brisbane Metro will make many improvements to the lives of Brisbane residents, including reducing congestion in the heart of the city by removing buses, utilising buses from the CBD into the suburbs, providing better options for transport from the city and all over Brisbane to UQ. As we know, Chair, you can travel from the city to UQ with a variety of options, but the Metro will provide a fine alternative to driving on Coronation Drive which does of course have one of the slowest average speeds in Brisbane of just 19 kilometers per hour. And I'll tell you why that's important. The Metro will replace the Route 66 bus service at the UQ Lakes station. Now the Route 66 currently operates every five minutes within peak periods and is the busiest route within the Brisbane network. Over the years, the demand for the service has continued to increase 
resulting in the need for additional services to be implemented in 2019. This trend is anticipated to continue and the M2 will better meet these future demands. The Metro 2 service will operate for 24 hours over the weekend and up to 20 hours on weekdays. In peak periods, the service will operate at three minute frequency. Brisbane Metro integrates with Cross River Rail by servicing key interchanges at Roma Street and Boggo Road, allowing rail passengers to easily access destinations not serviced by rail, such as education facilities like UQ and QT Kelvin Grove, as well as major hospitals. Brisbane Metro provides improved access to key centres, meeting places, employment and health and education facilities, supporting enhanced social and economic outcomes for community members, not just in Walter Taylor. In addition, Route 66 currently travels through Queen Street bus station, where it does not stop. The M2 will travel through the Adelaide Street Tunnel instead of the Queen Street bus station, before heading across the Victoria Bridge to the Cultural Centre station. This makes the M2 Metro line an attractive choice for the thousands upon thousands of students, academics and staff who travel to UQ from all over Brisbane. This council has delivered $7 billion of major infrastructure under the TransApex plan, the largest combination of infrastructure projects ever delivered in Australia by a council. Since Legacy Way opened in 2015, more than 120,000 vehicle movements have been removed off our city's surface roads and bus users have experienced average journey time savings of up to 13 minutes with patronage increased by 40% on inbound bus services. And I mention those stats, Chair, because it's the kind of outcome I know will be delivered through Brisbane Metro for my community and wider Brisbane. I say to everyone who's not already on board, get on board, support this investment in public transport improvements, support the 2,600 jobs that will be created and support this city's construction industry. Thanks. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Oh, Scott, excuse me, sorry, Councillor Johnston, there was a misrepresentation to Councillor Cassidy. The misrepresentation, please. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, Councillor Mackay's pre-written um, speech obviously didn't uh, account for the fact that we said we'd be voting in favour of this item and he said we weren't supporting it, so there you go. Thank you. Um, Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on item A. I will not be supporting uh, this project before us today. Um, when this matter has come to Council in previous years, I've expressed my concern um, about the project and that concern has crystallised um, under the incompetent um, administration of the Lord Mayor and the CEO of Council um, with this revised Metro project. Um, I asked six questions of the Lord Mayor in seeking further information um, earlier today, critical information um, required to make an informed decision about this project. Uh, and the Lord Mayor has refused and failed to answer any of those questions. Um, when I became aware of this item yesterday morning, um, we were given this paper on Sunday. Um, I asked the CEO for a briefing and he said we had all the information we needed to make a decision. So I'm going to run through the issues of concern as I see them um, and place on the record my disgust at the way that this council is handling um, the Brisbane Metro. Firstly, costs. Um, two and a bit years ago when uh, the first version of the significant contracting plan uh, came to us, uh, we were given a total value for the project, which included three components, um, of which council is keeping those figures secret. They're not public information. Um, one of those uh, was by far and away the largest component of uh, the, the uh, Brisbane Metro project, the Inner City Works, which included uh, the cultural centre um, uh, tunnel and new underground state of the art underground uh, bus station. Um, it's approximately half, you know, it's a big chunk of uh, the project. Now that has been cancelled. Let me be clear, um, it's not been postponed, it no longer forms part of the project. Um, and it is just disingenuous of the Lord Mayor to say it has been delayed. 
it is extremely clear in the council papers um, that this project no longer includes an underground uh, uh, tunnel, an underground station. And in the material provided on the council file today, um, it is extremely clear in the document um, 2nd of June 2020 that there is no further need for the portal which is discontinued. And I'm quoting from the document. There is no further need for the portal which is discontinued. Now, the Lord Mayor has tried to imply that somehow he's come to agreement with the state government about uh, this project. Um, the agreement is he has cut the most significant part of this project, um, the underground tunnel linking the Melbourne Street uh, busway uh, through to the Victoria Bridge, where the most significant bottleneck is, he's cut it completely. It's just not going to happen. Um, and instead, the buses are going to continue on the road network that so woefully does not accommodate um, the buses uh, now. Now, council is going to remove all the cars um, from these roadways uh, to try and get travel time savings. So let's move to that issue, delays. Um, again, the documentation in the council files before us today highlights that under the revised scope that we are being asked to consider today, far from what Councillor Mackay has just said, and he used the word, it would be the same, it is extremely clear that all the language in this document, and I doubt he's read the files, is similar. So let's look at what they consider to be similar. Uh, the uh, estimated delays around the new at-grade surface station uh, up to one to two minutes. These delays start from 2021. Now, I don't know why 2021 is being used as a figure. Um, is that when this project is now going to be delivered? I don't think a project of this size can be delivered in the next year. I don't know why we're saying that in 2021 there are going to be delays um, to travel times when the project's not going to start till 2022 or even later. So one of my question was, when is this project going to be delivered? The Lord Mayor cannot answer that either. Now, there are extremely significant delays that are going to result in uh, the delivery of this project due to the change in scope. And in particular, I want to note my concern um, about the queuing length delays and the time boarding delays that are going to occur at multiple stations, including numerous Southside stations, including most specifically and egregiously at Buranda and Boggo Road. The council papers that are were available in the file for any councillor to look at provide huge detail about, well, not huge, um, but some detail about the impacts uh, and the adverse impacts um, that are going to occur from congestion as a result of the way in which these buses are now going to um, move through the revised project. It is outlined in black and white in the document dated 2 April 2020. So the Leader of the Opposition is completely correct that the administration were well aware that there were massive problems with the delivery of this project, including adverse time impacts from the new busway um, as far back as early April. Now, that's when the report was produced, so presumably the information had been prepared earlier than that. So let's move on to the pedestrian impacts. Um, because there are adverse impacts for queuing at the new Cultural Station Bus Centre, um, the estimated storage capacity is going to blow out at certain peak periods up to 71 metres. This means that there are going to be queuing impacts back to the intersection of Melbourne Street and Grey Street. Um, and that is going to impact on uh, the crossing point. That is why this scramble crossing that was proposed to improve pedestrian access around one of the busiest places in Brisbane is being scrapped, scrapped in black and white in here. 
Um, it is absolutely inappropriate that this administration scraps pedestrian improvements around this area. We are going to see buses queuing along uh, Melbourne Street at the Cultural Centre bus station. That is the problem now. That is going to be the problem from the minute this project starts. That is what is identified in Council's documents uh, and in the project before us today. Um, we don't know uh, how much this project is going to cost. The business case was based on a completely different project. We don't know if it still stacks up. Um, certainly it doesn't on queuing times, it doesn't on delays. Um, we know that there's 125 bus services going to be cut. We still don't know where. We know there is no direct connection for Southside residents to the University of Queensland. It's so wonderful, uh, wonderful for Councillor Mackay that you'll be able to get from the north side, uh, you know, to UQ. But if you live at Salisbury or Mount Cravat or Runcorn or Oxley, you can't get directly to the University of Queensland um, because there is no connection between the two routes on the south side of Brisbane and you have to go into the Marta station and then come back uh, through all the congested stations to get to UQ. Now, let me be clear. Um, this project was poorly conceptualised um, way back when it was announced. It was a thought bubble um, by this Lord Mayor. And we've heard the problem fundamentally today. He will not let this project be scuttled. That is what the Lord Mayor has said to us today. He is persisting with a project that has gone pear-shaped at every stage. Rail project, tunnel project, none of these things are happening any longer. It has been bungled, it no longer adds up, and today he's asking us to approve massive changes to a project without telling us how much it will cost. In principle, we're cutting the most substantial part of the infrastructure delivery, but the Lord Mayor has publicly said the project is going to cost more. Why? Why? Why can't the CEO tell us? Why can't the Lord Mayor tell us? Why are we having a project that no longer delivers the bus improvements that this city needs, um, delivering the most important part of the project, which was solving the bottleneck around South Brisbane? This project no longer does any of those things. It has been bungled. And this Lord Mayor is persisting with a botched project simply because he wants to deliver something. It's not the right project. Um, and trying to sell it as a positive when clearly it no longer in any way, shape or form will deliver on the necessary future um, infrastructure that we need for this city is just appalling. Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. I would uh, definitely seek an extension of time if uh, if I could. I, by convention, well, if there's, is there someone moving one? Yeah, I'd move an extension of time. I'd be, I'd be interested to hear what yeah. Councillor Johnston has to say. Councillor Shree, is there a second? Uh, is there a seconder? Can I second it? No. Oh, um, Steve. Councillor Griffiths had his hand up. Councillor Griffiths. All right. I have um, uh, an extension of time um, moved by Councillor Shree, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. All those in favour of an extension of time, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. The no, oh, no's have it. it. No's have it. Oh, um, that was definitely the eyes had it. No, they, they didn't. Um, but, but we can have a division if you wish. Is there a seconder? All right, the, the no's have it. Uh, further speakers? Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I also would like to speak on the amendment to the significant contracting plan. And those are the three words that I like to say in this place, significant contracting plan, because it means that this council is getting on with the job of creating jobs, confidence, and ensuring that our public transport infrastructure keeps pace with our city's growth. Um, if uh, you were listening from home, which I know there's not many people that do, and you listen to what Councillor Johnson just said, you would be wondering what the heck was going on. First of all, we hear it's a thought bubble from this Lord Mayor, 
when it clearly has been something that this administration has proudly stood by for more than five years in this place, not a thought bubble by this Lord Mayor. But that is just beginning of the misreading of details that we hear from the Councillor from Tennyson again. I'm glad to hear that Councillor Johnson is now a transport expert and she can read the papers. Unfortunately, she's read the papers on what the issues would be if we did not do this project. There would be queuing. There would be delays and it would not work. That is why this administration took the step to yes, Councillor. I don't need to turn it. Yep, noted. Councillor Adams, please continue. Uh, point of order, Mr Chairman. Yes, Councillor Johnston. Thank you. I um, claim to be misrepresented. I've already said I've noted it. So, Councillor Adams. Thank you. And as I was just saying through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Cassidy, uh, that this is the job of the state government, but it also is, as he said, the responsibility of council to make sure that we deliver for our residents. So we are doing the heavy lifting for the state government on their responsibility in public transport as well. As the Lord Mayor announced to the Chamber two weeks ago, another milestone has been reached for this game-changing metro with the preferred tenderer of Brisbane moved, be, move being announced. And I congratulate them as the preferred tenderer. And I'd like, and I, like the Lord Mayor, would like to acknowledge the uh, hard work and effort and passion to helping deliver the Bet Brisbane Metro that they and the other two consortia demonstrated with their tenders. It was a long, long job and they did an amazing work working with council and the officers as well. Um, I was very proud for just under 12 months to be the chair for Buses, Boats and Bridges because I could see clearly what we are delivering here in this administration is an improvement. It is going to be better for Brisbane. That is why I'm so passionate about seeing the Brisbane Metro every day getting closer to being delivered. What we have here today is the significant contracting plan for the first stage uh, and the original one for the inner city uh, infrastructure that we had, had the early works and the metro vehicles to allow us to go to market with the tenders and ultimately award contracts. Today, we're to deliver the investment in the public transport network that will get residents home 50% quicker with peak services every three minutes. Get those buses and no, not cancelled buses through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Johnson. Get those buses into the CBD, back out to our suburbs that are not needed once the metro has a turn up and go system as well. Reduce the congestion in the city and uh, make it easier for people to, to travel across the city as well. It is true that this no longer includes the undergrounding in this contract. Again, a detail that Councillor Johnson seems to misunderstand. This is for the contract at hand. Point of order, Mr Chair. <coughs> Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. Through you, Councillor Johnson clearly said the underground is off the table, off the table, never to be done, off the table. That is not the case. It is not in this contracting plan because we have amended it with our agreement with the state government and we are going to be upgrading the existing surface roads to make sure that we have capacity for 10 years to deliver a turn up and go system to the people of Brisbane. The buses will not be just traveling through what you see there now at South Brisbane. It will be a new surface network and clearly says so in the documents we have here today. Existing at grade surface station improvements to increase capacity, improve the urban design and the public realm outcomes to include the whole vicinity for active transport and public safety, which means pedestrians as well. Uh, we know also from uh, what we've heard from over the years from our ALP opposition that they haven't always been positive about the Metro, uh, but they do advocate for more investment in public transport. So um, they have always said as uh, they would only support Metro if we reach an agreement with the state and that is what we actually have here. And I'm glad to hear that Councillor Cassidy is supporting this significant contract plan today to go forward so we can invest in public transport for this state. 
as the Lord Mayor has clearly said, and we'll reiterate it again for the likes of Councillor Johnson, the state government has said we can get on with this project, that we can remove the cultural centre underground station off this critical path because the modelling shows we can get at least 10 years of existing ground station solution and that means we can start the public realm improvements which are underground councillor cassidy in one of our most iconic streets in adelaide street as well we can start working on the green victoria bridge which is a found fantastic outcome for the whole of the city and moving around the cbd and of course the works at north quay which will offer great access to one of our beautiful natural assets, the Brisbane River, um, on that side of the river as well. Brisbane Move is made up of Axiona and Arup, both of whom have an extensive history in partnering with council on projects as well as for our state. Axiona was in the consortium that built the second range crossing at Toowoomba, as well as the Legacy Way Tunnel that when completed as a result of, again, this council's record investment in Trans Apex has meant the removal of more than 120,000 vehicles off our surface roads and improved travel times for public transport of at least 13 minutes through the western suburbs. Arab has also got an extensive experience through projects like Airport Link, Cross River Rail and Stage 1 of the Gold Coast Light Rail as well. So following this agreement with the Minister, we can get onto that next milestone, finalise the design and award the contract to deliver the public realm improvements for Adelaide Street, great public realm and improved active transport connections at North Quay, deliver our commitment to a green Victoria Bridge with three lanes for buses and metro surface, a bi-directional bikeway and improved pedestrian pathways, which will all see a vastly improved public realm in the Queensland cultural precinct. We've also been future-proofing the land for the Rochdale Depot as well and uh, making sure that with the latest technology we have zero tailgate emission and battery electric vehicles. We've started work on those four intersection upgrades that are needed at Peel Street and to future-proof the Victoria Bridge as well as ultimately the undergrounding of the Cultural Centre station. So as I said, I thank those on the, the opposition side that are going to support this today. This city will now see another undergrounding through Adelaide Street with fantastic public realm benefit. And it's unfortunate the undergrounding at South Brisbane has been a stumbling block for Jackie Trout, oh, sorry, for Minister Bailey. Uh, but we now have the ability to see a generational upgrade to transport and support the 2,600 jobs that will be fast-tracked as a result. I recommend this report to the Chamber. I have, uh, Councillor, Councillor Johnston, you have two items of misrepresentation. Yes, on the first item, um, Councillor Adams claimed uh, that I made certain comments about the removal of the portal. I quoted from the document, uh, which very clearly says the portal has been cut from this project and has been discontinued. Um, with, respect, with respect to the second point of misrepresentation, which is about travel times, um, it is extremely clear in the council documents provided to us today that I relied on that there are significant adverse uh, time delays as a result of the revised scope of this project between one and two minutes. And that is very Thank clearly you. outlined in the document. Further, further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I don't want to speak for too long on this item. I just want to note again for the record that I'm very, very supportive of closing off um, Grey Street uh, just before where it intersects with Melbourne Street in South Brisbane. So I've um, shared this idea with Council in the past, but in a nutshell, the proposal is that Grey Street would become a cul-de-sac in front of the South Brisbane train station and would also become a cul-de-sac for vehicles uh, in a, a, around the vicinity of Fish Lane. What that would mean is that there would be no through traffic, no general general motor vehicle traffic through the intersection of Melbourne Street and Grey Street. That op opens up quite a broad range of opportunities in terms of the cultural centre station redesign, such as turning part of Grey Street into a large public park in front of South Brisbane train station. It also allows for a, a freer flow of pedestrians uh, be between the existing side of the current cultural centre busway station and, and the South Brisbane train station. So there are quite a few options uh, available to council if there's a general willingness to close off Grey Street to through traffic. And I think 
um, while I'm not supportive of this motion day and I have concerns with the whole process, I think um, what the delay in finalising decisions about the cultural centre station does do is facilitate um, opportunities for further discussions about how we can make the best of this metro project to redesign the whole precinct in a way that delivers more public green space and community facilities perhaps. So, um, yeah, I'm still generally supportive of the principle of the Metro. I still have a lot of concerns with how it's been administered and um, how it's been delivered. But I just want to emphasise very clearly that the, um, there is a really good opportunity here if we're willing to close off um, Grey Street to cars and, and that that would potentially save Council a lot of money by um, perhaps opening up a few other options in terms of where the, the way that uh, buses and Metro vehicles flow through the Melbourne Street intersection. Also just want to note, again, for the record, my ongoing concerns that I'm not receiving regular enough briefings about the Metro project as a local councillor, despite the fact that some of the most significant elements of this project fall within and directly impact my ward. Um, generally, I find that there's very little consultation about what's going on. Um, I often find that the... the when I am consulted, it's more of a here's what we're going to do rather than a what do you think. And I think that causes problems down the track because council doesn't actually check in with me and the local community about what the community's views are for that area. Um, as a result, then the community has to engage in advocacy targeting the state government. The state government then has to express concerns back to council. It all gets very messy and causes a lot of additional rigmarole. So... If council is feeling frustrated that sometimes decisions between council and the state government aren't going smoothly, it might actually help to brief me as the local councillor more often so that at least I'm aware of what's going on and can advocate for the project um, because I think at the moment there's a bit of shadow boxing going on and a lot of crossed wires because there aren't good communication channels. Um, I've, I've actually found it quite disappointing to um, experience so little consultation as a councillor over such a big project. Um, the briefings are very infrequent um, and lack detail. And so hopefully going forward, we can we can change that. Um, there's an opportunity here, particularly in terms of the South Brisbane elements of the project to involve me as a local councillor to find out what I have to say and what I think could be viable um, and work with me constructively so we can actually get some really positive outcomes rather than cutting me out of the conversation not treating me as a major stakeholder and then later having to deal with pushback and, and problems down the track. So it's in general been really frustrating and concerning that so many decisions about um, the metro around the South Bank and South Brisbane precinct have been made behind closed doors without involving local residents and without involving me as local councillor. Obviously the fig trees on um, Peel Street and Stanley Street, that's one small example, but there have been a lot of occasions where it's felt like other institutional stakeholders have been consulted a lot more than I have. And often as a councillor, I find that it's quicker for me to go to QPAC or to Queensland Museum or to look for inside channels within the state government to find our state government employees, hey, what's going on with the Brisbane City Council Metro project? Because it's easier for me to find out information about what's happening with council's metro project from talking to public servants or employees in other NGOs um, than it is to get information out of Brisbane City Council directly. So I provide that as constructive feedback for Council in the hope that going forward I'll, I'll be able to be kept in the loop a bit more and that Council officers will actually approach me to ask for my opinion before decisions are made. Um, I think that would be much more constructive and a, and a much better way forward. So I'll leave that with the Chamber to consider. Thanks. Further speakers? Councillor Murphy. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to uh, speak on item A, which is the submission presented to the special ENC committee meeting held on Friday. And this is another milestone for the game-changing project for our city uh, that has been reached with the announcement of the preferred collaborative partnership tenderer for the scope of works that are outlined in the submission before us. And I note that uh, Councillor Adams and the Lord Mayor have already acknowledged the very impressive track record of Asiona, uh, in particular their contribution to building the Legacy Way Tunnel, which uh, was a jewel or is the jewel in the crown of the Trans Apex 
uh, program. Thousands of employees across the world are employed by Asiona, including 40 staff right here in Brisbane, and our design partner uh, in Brisbane Move has 400 staff in the city. So it's great to see these companies uh, working on a game-changing project for our city. I do think it was um, kind of disappointing that Councillor Cassidy attacked uh, Asiona over the Sydney Light Rail project. Um, the reality is that that project was a, a hard dollar design and construct contract in very difficult uh, circumstances. We've avoided the pitfalls that are associated with those kind of contracts by going with a, a collaborative partnership model of procurement. This uh, procurement model is actually best practice for uh, complex projects such as Brisbane Metro. Um, Councillor Cassidy uh, also had a go at the project timeframes. He said we should have uh, done all the planning at the start uh, in 2016. Um, but I, I have with me chair, I keep it close to me at all times. I go to bed with it. It's the uh, Rod Harding light rail plan released in 2016. Uh, that's the last time the Labor Party did any hard work on policy development for a council election. Uh, and that has a time frame set out for procurement of this major light rail project. Um, step one, establish a project executive to oversee the planning and delivery. And there's seven steps, and I won't go through them all, Chair, but um, essentially it starts, start design and construct of the initial route uh, in 2019-20. So the time frame that Councillor Cassidy is so, is so convinced that it's, uh, it's all gone to hell uh, and, it, and the project is behind schedule is the exact same time frame uh, that the former leader of the ALP outlined for his own major project, the last time the Labor Party took uh, a major project to an election. So, I mean, let's just let's just get a dose of reality when it comes to uh, them criticising the timeframes they've been working to on this project. He also, um, he called the Lord Mayor the most ineffective and inconsequential Lord Mayor ever. Um, and I simply say to that, you should see the guy he beat. You should see the guy he beat because if this is the most ineffective and inconsequential Lord Mayor, he holds 19 out of 26 seats in the city. So, um, you know... I think that is self-evident in the opposition. Now, I'm turning to the submission for uh, the revision of the SCP, the significant contracting plan before us. I think it's very simple. The SCP came to full council on the 22nd of June, 2018. And this was an SCP to allow council to go to the market to tender for the delivery of the inner city works, the Metro vehicle, and then the early works as well. This was not supported at the time by the ALP. And I'm really pleased that they have changed their tune and they've gotten on board Brisbane Metro. Back in June 2018, they said they wouldn't support industry and construction jobs being created. They didn't support investment in a turn up and go service, 24 hours on the weekend, connecting 18 stations along a 21 kilometre alignment of dedicated busway corridor. They didn't support peak services every three minutes, getting people home quicker and safer. The revised SCP reflects that residents don't want to hear us squabbling about this project. They want to see us taking steps to go forward and that's what this SCP shows. It shows agreement with the state government that the underground cultural centre station can be deferred, that can be taken off the critical path because the modelling shows us that the at-grade cultural centre station will work for at least 10 years after Brisbane Metro comes online. The revised scope of works being put forward today for, for support will deliver the biggest investment in public transport the council has ever seen um, since and actually one of the biggest investments that we've made in a single project since the legacy way tunnel as well as creating 2600 jobs at a time when as we've heard from the deputy mayor previously brisbane unemployment is the highest it's predicted to have been uh, in in living memory for so many people now this revised scp will deliver the adelaide street tunnel by mining instead of more uh, impactful cut and cover, minimising the impacts of one of our most iconic streets, an early street of our city, and uh, also the impact that would be felt on local businesses as well as pedestrians and public transport. The revised SCP will deliver on the vision for Adelaide Street from Edward Street to Victoria Bridge to deliver a world-class public realm. And the revised SCP will deliver 
a public realm and active transport connections at North Quay between Adelaide Street and Victoria Bridge, including a rest stop at North Quay to enjoy the view of our beautiful river. The revised SCP will deliver on a green Victoria Bridge, a boulevard that connects the heart of our CBD to the heart of our cultural and arts precinct and a dedicated bi-directional bikeway with improved pedestrian connections. This revised SCP delivers vastly improved public realm in the Queensland Cultural Precinct. And I know uh, that Councillor Cassidy has seen those images because his response was the standard response from the Australian Labor Party. Even, and the answer was no, even when his own colleagues in the state government are saying that they support the approach that council is taking with the surface option. By deferring the Cultural Centre Underground Station, because the CP tenderer, for, tenderer has said that they can uh, deliver this outcome, and because the modelling shows we can get 10 years at the siting grade solution, because we'll never get back a year's worth of delays, because projects only get more expensive, because we said we would continue to work with the state and the precinct stakeholders, and because we support jobs for our economy, 2,600 jobs, we will be supporting this submission today. And we know the Labor Party and the Chamber aren't happy, even though they are going to vote for it, and I really do welcome that support. I really do. Um, but you have to ask, Mr Chair, what Labor Party really matters here? The same tired old opposition with the same tired played out lines have been running on Metro for many years, you know, calling it a big bendy bus and carrying on. Or the State Labor Transport and Main Roads Minister, Mark Bailey, who has been working very closely with Council hand in hand to progress this project over the past few uh, weeks and months now. We thank him for his support and cooperation. And we look forward to working very closely with the state's Cross River Rail project to transform public transport in Brisbane. Brisbane Metro will deliver a greater transport network that will get buses out of our city and back into our suburbs. It will deliver a turn up and go service 24 hours on the weekend. It is a game changer and I commend the submission before us to get on with the job, create the 2,600 jobs that will be created by this council investment and get Brisbane moving. Thank you, Chair. Further speakers? I see no hands to Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, right. So, um, I predicted Council Cassidy would finally get on board and support the Brisbane Metro today. And I just want to say, I told you so. I told you so. It is... A, an historic moment in the city's history where the Labor Party gets on board Brisbane Metro despite years of bagging it. Uh, and in fact, despite bagging the project today, they're still getting on board and that's what's important. Um, and history will show the record that they voted to support the next uh, vital phase of Brisbane Metro. So thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, I appreciate that support. Um, even though it was given with forked tongue, um, support is support and we will take it because this is the right project at the right time for the City of Brisbane. Uh, look, uh, Councillor Cassidy obviously had a, a prepared speech. Um, not sure whether he wrote that or someone else wrote it for him, but it's the same tired lines that he's been trying to peddle for years. Um, he, he seems to have this view that if only people knew that this is big bendy buses that we're talking about that, you know, that would vote the LNP out of office. Well, the project changed in 2017, Councillor Cassidy, and you've been calling them big bendy buses since 2017. Okay, we had an election between then and okay. now, and guess what? The people of Brisbane want this Brisbane Metro project. They are champing at the bit to ride on those big bendy vehicles or whatever you might want to call them, uh, light trams, whatever you might want to call them, they're champing at the bit to ride on those turn up and go uh, services. Uh, and history will also show that people that stood in the way of this project uh, will be judged harshly. Now, uh, Minister Bailey knows that and he's on board. Um, and, you know, I will give him the first ticket to ride uh, on Brisbane Metro uh, because good on him. He, um, he, he knows this is an important project and, and uh, commendation to uh, 
Mr Bailey, Minister Bailey, for his work in recent weeks. Uh, but Councillor Cassidy will be riding at the back of the vehicle, um, sulking all the way down the 21 kilometre route uh, when Metro services uh, first start running. But the reality is, uh, like I touched on before, this is such a critical project that we cannot afford to spend more time talking about the design of an underground station when we know that an upgrade to the above ground station has at least a decade. Point of order. Yes, yes, I was calling you. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Oh, Mr. Chairman, your microphone doesn't appear to be working then. You're the only one who's been saying so, so please just make your point of order. Yes, uh, thank you. Would the Lord Mayor take a question? Lord Mayor, will you take a question? No, he won't. He won't say he won't. how much it will cost? No, that's, no, he's not taking the question. You know the rules. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> the Brisbane Metro project is about getting people home quicker and spending more time talking about the design of the underground cultural centre station will not get people home quicker. That is the reality. Uh, and so uh, the modelling shows that upgrades to the above ground station have at least a decade in them, a decade of fantastic transport benefits, a decade of seeing uh, the Victoria Bridge uh, working properly uh, with its conversion to a green bridge to become part of uh, the separated transport network, uh, the Adelaide Street Tunnel uh, becoming part of the separated transport network, uh, delivering better travel times, uh, delivering better reliability and delivering that ability to deliver the, the three minute um, turn up and go type service that we're talking about here. Um, so we know um, that with the complexity of the underground station, you could easily spend many, many more months or even years talking about what the optimum design is. We've had uh, hundreds of meetings with the state government. We've engaged with all of the stakeholders and we have tried um, every angle uh, and looking at every possible design, uh, but the right decision is to draw a line under that, uh, to take that underground station off the critical path and to move forward uh, with the other major construction components of the project. There will be an upgraded cultural centre station. It will be simply at surface as opposed to underground. That upgraded cultural centre station will deliver uh, improvements in uh, capacity and will deliver travel time savings. The conversion of Victoria Bridge to a Green Bridge will deliver improvements to capacity and travel time savings, not to mention improvements for uh, pedestrians and cyclists. And the construction of the Adelaide Street Tunnel linking into King George Square Station will deliver, once again, travel time savings and reliability improvements. Uh, and this project, Brisbane Metro, is a system. Labor or other councillors would have you believe it's about a different people. Uh, some people would say, interestingly now, that it's about one station. No, it is a system. It's a mass transit system. Uh, that is the way uh, that it was set up from the 2017 change of design, uh, which we released publicly uh, and very clearly as the best way to proceed with this project. And since then, it has always been a system. And a system is a, a range of multiple working parts that work together to deliver a better outcome, a more efficient outcome, a more reliable outcome, better and more frequent services. And that's what Brisbane Metro will do. And from the perspective of the people of Brisbane, it cannot come soon enough. Uh, so this decision today, which um, I'm told has bipartisan support, uh, is the right decision. And I look forward to getting on, uh, working with Axiona and Arup, uh, to get on with the major construction and create those jobs, uh, working with our partners in the state government, in the federal government, in industry, uh, to deliver a fantastic outcome for the city. I finally wanted to touch on the 
commentary about Axiona and add on to uh, what Councillor Murphy said. Uh, well, the comment about Sydney Light Rail came up. Now, uh, we know that uh, Labor councillors were in the lead up to the 2016 election promising modern light rail. They were promising a Sydney light, the subway. Rail, Sydney light rail style of project. Uh, so one thing that Axiona knows and they've learned uh, is that getting rid of the tracks and the poles and the wires and de-risking the project is the right thing to do. And I would remind people that uh, on the day that Sydney Light Rail opened, the Minister for Transport in New South Wales said that there won't be any further extensions of Sydney Light Rail and that the future was trackless trams. He was referring to the type of vehicle that we will be using for Brisbane Metro. Oh. It's the type of vehicle that's being investigated for other uh, public transport projects in Sydney and in other cities. Uh, and I'm proud that Brisbane will be leading the way in Australia when it comes to this type of technology uh, because it helps to cut down a lot of those risks and problems uh, and impacts that come with uh, the older technology of uh, tracks and wires that we've seen uh, in places like Sydney. And so Axiona, more than anyone, knows the lessons of that project. Uh, they know the lessons of projects like Legacy Way. They know the lessons of projects like uh, the Toowoomba uh, Second Range Crossing. And this is a project, this is a, a team of people that uh, we've worked with before, have been incredibly professional. Uh, and when I stood uh, on Sunday with uh, the uh, managing director of uh, Axiona for the Asia Pacific region and New Zealand, um, uh, a gentleman called Fernando, he uh, reminded me that he came to Brisbane as um, the project director of Legacy Way on behalf of Axiona. And that was around 10 years ago he came to Brisbane. And he is now not only an ongoing proud Brisbane resident, but he has become an Australian citizen. He's a member of our community and is so proud, not only of what has been delivered through Legacy Way, but proud of the opportunity now coming with Brisbane Metro. Uh, it's a great success story uh, to see people coming here to work on infrastructure projects, becoming Australian citizens, integrating into the local community and now uh, working with us to create uh, thousands of jobs and deliver Brisbane's very first turn up and go mass transit system. So uh, I thank Labor councillors for their support uh, of this important submission. We look forward to progressing the project and getting on with it. Uh, and the support is certainly appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for councillors. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour of item A, say aye and raise your hands. Aye. 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 Thank you, and please lower them. And those against, say no and raise your hands. No. Thank you, the ayes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston. We definitely need a division. I see no seconder. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. I will now uh, draw your attention to the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, please. The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the meeting held of City Planning Economic Development Committee report for the meeting held on Tuesday, the 2nd of June, 2020, be adopted. Just a second. Oh, yeah, I see. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hammond, to the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting that a Tuesday, the 2nd of June, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Counts uh, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Last week we had a very interesting presentation from our Economic Development Manager around the COVID-19 impact monitoring study that we've done on community vulnerability, expenditure analysis and city life data. Um, our city analytics team through ED have been working hard on monitoring the impacts of COVID since the early indicators of disruption to better understand how our city is changing and responding through this time of crisis. This includes monitoring pedestrian counts in core precincts, analysing spending data and understanding some of the broader social implications that have um, resulted from the citywide disruption. The federal government has now confirmed that based on recent data, the economy is officially in recession and the expectation for the next quarter is expected to be worse than what we've just seen. 
Our projections suggest that by June 30, the number of job losses in Brisbane uh, could equate to approximately 135,000 jobs. As you might expect, the largest, largest job losses are expected within hospitality, tourism and the arts, and the majority of job losses are focused around the inner city areas. With fewer people employed and greater financial implications for households, we estimate that an average residents are spending between 100 to $120 million less per month in our businesses and economy in Brisbane. We are now gradually starting to see people return to work and more businesses reopen. And projections that council has drawn from this data will be critical to make sure that we inform our responses um, for our strategy for recovery to get this city back on its feet as quickly and as safely as possible. I know the Economic Recovery Task Force led by Councillor Allen is working feverishly in line with the budget announcements just in a week's time. And we know that the fast tracking of infrastructure is vital to keep people employed in our very important industry of building and construction too. But unfortunately, as we have seen today, the Labor State Government does not believe, nor the ALP on the other side as well, that the inordinate job losses in the state capital are any anywhere near as important as the rest of Queensland, unfortunately. But I uh, leave the few petitions that are here as well to debate to the Chambers. Thank you. Further speakers? Yes, thanks. thanks. Um, I'd just like to speak quite briefly on um, item F, the petition uh, that is requesting um, uh, the Seeing Our District Neighbourhood Plan be approved with Heritage Buildings Preserve while building a new future economy and living solutions for all. Essentially, this this petition um, was started uh, in support of six-storey um, development uh, in the Sandgate Village area um, as part of the Sandgate uh, and District Neighbourhood Plan. Um, there's another petition coming to Council uh, that went through committee today um, that'll be coming to Council next week, so I'll talk in more depth um, at that point, but um, I think it is very fair to say, and I'll put this on record now, that the people of Sandgate and surrounding suburbs have spoken um, fairly loudly and clearly on this issue. This petition, which essentially um, uh, is supporting six-storey development in Sandgate, received 82 signatures and quite a bit of publicity locally. Uh, the petition that was opposing six-storey development as part of this neighbourhood plan process received uh, 2,714 signatures, uh, which is coming to council next week. So I'll speak a bit more about that. Uh, but what is very interesting is the arguments that were made uh, in this petition and by people who were um, who were, who were putting uh, this this position out there in the community uh, was that um, redevelopment of an area which had retail down the bottom and uh, units above it would be good for local business, uh, would create more jobs. And there's an article out just today uh, in the Courier Mail um, which talks about um, the Lutwich Road shops being vacant as oversupply leaves a ghost town feel and there's even a local real estate agent uh, which, which says and sums up, I think, the sentiment of the community. We didn't need it. No one asked for it. It was just a town planning idea. Uh, so uh, while I supported the recommendation here and that this feedback will be taken on board in this process, I think the, um, the feedback that we'll get next week um, will be very telling. Thanks, Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Oh, yes, just briefly on item E, uh, the petition requesting council refuse the development application at Nine Lay Close, uh, Sherwood. Um, uh, this uh, development proposal was for two fast food restaurants, um, one of which was identified as a McDonald's and the other one was not identified as a particular fast food restaurant. It's a very small site. It's uh, constrained by Sherwood Road and the bus depot. Um, and it's in an extremely poor location. Um, council allowed the bus depot to proceed, even though it did not have proper sight lines for the new intersection created to provide access uh, to lay close uh, for the buses. And it's, um, you know, it's problematic now because it's created developable land that really has quite limited uh, uses. Um, fast food restaurant um, without a footpath, um, without any public transport, with limited parking and with all of the safety issues um, with 800 buses and then hundreds of workers a day going in and out of a very small laneway uh, did not make a lot of sense. So it was good news uh, that council um, did uh, refuse 
uh, to progress this development in terms of engaging uh, with an information request. Um, uh, I understand that public notification was undertaken in April. I have some serious concerns about that because I do drive past regularly and I certainly did not see the signs up. Um, it's quite set back from the road um, and there are numerous frontages and I think it is um, very disappointing um, uh, that, and perhaps I'm not sure, but I would be concerned about whether there's been full compliance with public notification uh, with respect to this. Um, but I have put my concerns on the record to council uh, through um, the DA process. I would encourage council to continue to refuse this development. Um, it's, it's much too intense for the site. It's contrary to the type of use that's allowed under the zoning. Um, and it is not supported by um, the necessary road, pedestrian, cycling or public transport infrastructure needed to service um, you know, fast food in this location. And, and picking up on a point that Councillor Cassidy just made, um, the continued out of centre development um, that this council is allowing is killing the high streets in our city. Um, it's, it's clearer than it's ever been in the last year or so that high streets all over Brisbane, it doesn't matter what ward you're in, um, are struggling. Um, part of that is the way in which uh, the nature of shopping has changed um, to a more online uh, offering. But part of that is the proliferation of out of centre development um, and council has allowed it over the last few years, and it is to the detriment of areas um, such as high streets that are zoned for commercial and retail offering. Um, but unfortunately, developers are finding it cheaper to get a block of land in a residential uh, or an industrial area and then try and change uh, the use of that land. Um, and that is not the way we should be going about uh, town planning in this area. We're seeing it with childcare centres. Um, it's a huge problem. Um, they shouldn't be springing up everywhere in low density residential areas. And likewise, we should not be seeing um, retail in areas where it's not zoned uh, you know, for retail um, within a few hundred metres, either to Rockley in the east or Sherwood in the west, um, there are areas that are zoned um, for this type of in centre uh, development. Um, and it is critical that council does not continue to undermine high streets, which perform such an important economic, social, um, and practical function um, for local neighbourhoods. So I urge council to refuse this application. Um, I know that they've indicated that they will do so, um, but the key is going to come uh, with um, uh, any appeal. And unfortunately, council has a history of rolling over in the appeals process uh, and uh, doing a deal uh, with the developer to allow uh, development once the matter goes to appeal. Um, and I've seen that happen so many times in my ward and it's to the detriment of our local community. Um, we can now see in this city, in almost every part of this city, the impact of the poor planning of this LNP administration. And it's critical that um, developments that do not meet uh, the codes, that do not meet the zoning, do not meet the requirements of city plan are not approved. So I urge council uh, to respect the wishes of residents here um, and to strongly oppose this development. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, to the councils for their contribution. Councillor Cassidy, I think as you've shown, there is uh, quite a diverse uh, range of views around the San Great District neighbourhood plan. It is under consideration and obviously several petitions from both sides keep coming in around that as well. Um, as for Councillor Johnson's uh, contribution, can I apologise to the hardworking uh, legal team that work hard to defend all of the decisions that we make in council. And when they are ordered by the courts to mediate, there should be no imputing motive in this place, as she has clearly said many times this evening. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. And raise your hand. Aye. And all those again, please lower your hands. And all those against say no, and please raise your hands. The ayes have it. Councils, the Public and Active Transport Committee, please.
Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 2nd of June 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Owen, the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 2nd of June 2020 uh, be adopted. Uh, Councillor Murphy. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Last week's committee presentation was all about how Council embraces the Brisbane River as an asset when it comes to public and active transport. Uh, I don't propose to go into detail about the committee presentation. Um, we also received two petitions, one requesting Council paint the Kangaroo Point bikeway between uh, Velloway 1 and Hamilton Street. Uh, all councillors were supportive except for Councillor Shree. Council uh, supports improvement to the Riverwalk here, which is recognised as a primary cycle route. Further widening and upgrade of these paths is required. Um, in the interim, a Council will investigate minor improvements and repairs to pavement and signage treatments, and that was explained to the committee. And then a second petition requesting Council maintain navigable bridge height under any new bridges on the Brisbane River. All members of the committee voted in favour of the recommendation, which uh, recorded that Council uh, will be delivering the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge at no lower height than the Captain Cook Bridge, which is the current point of restriction in the Brisbane River. And um, I'm happy to leave the debate to the Chamber. Further, speaker, uh, further speakers? Uh, Councillor uh, uh, Councillor Street, but before I call you, Councillors, Councillor Toomey will be chairing the meeting from this point until my return. Councillor Street. Thanks, Chair. Just really briefly on the Kangaroo Point, uh, the petition relating to the Kangaroo Point um, Riverside Bikeway. My concerns with the petition response are, are essentially that it doesn't commit to clear courses of action within a well-defined time frame. Um, obviously, this is an ongoing issue along the Kangaroo Point Riverfront. We're seeing sig significant conflicts between pedestrians and cyclists. There are higher and higher volumes of active transport commuters using that um, Riverside Corridor. And although it's a good start for the council to be investigating further changes to signs and lines, we've been raising this as an issue for, for years now. And I worry that uh, the commitment to investigate further changes simply isn't strong enough. Um, what I would like to see from the council is a, a clearer strategy in terms of how we're gonna manage those rising volumes along that riverside pathway um, and some very clear project, pro, clearly defined projects and clear timelines. Uh, the high volume of commuter cyclists in particular along that Riverside bikeway arises in part from the fact that we don't have safe bike lanes on other major roads through the precinct. Um, so roads like Main Street leading up through Kangaroo Point, River Terrace along the top of the Kangaroo Point cliffs, even the um, stretch of Vulture Street that runs through the middle of South Brisbane and Wollongabba, none of these major corridors have safe separated bike lanes. And so as a result, there's a, a much higher volume of fast moving commuter cyclists using those riverside bikeways. The future Kangaroo Point footbridge will go some way towards addressing these issues, but it's still quite a, a long, long while away. Um, and in the meantime, I think making it safer for cyclists to use some more direct routes through the peninsula, if they wish, would actually take away quite a bit of that pressure along those riverside pathways. So, um, for example, cyclists who are coming over the Goodwill Bridge and, and heading east, they'll often ride all the way around the riverside pathway of the Kangaroo Point Peninsula when they would probably prefer to head directly east along a corridor like Vulture Street if it was safe to do so. And so... Um, there's a lot of additional value in some of those on-road bike lane facilities that I've been proposing in the past. And in a way, that's that's probably one of the most practical steps towards addressing the congestion and conflict issues along those riverside pathways. The, as, I've, as I've said, the, there are quite a few problem spots along that western side of the Kangaroo Point Peninsula, in particular around the Thornton Street Ferry Terminal and also around River Life. Um, some of those concerns around river life could be addressed with better management of the river life facility. And I've raised those concerns with councils, various teams in the past, and haven't seen a lot of action. But uh, the further north around Thornton Street, there needs to be a proper redesign of that space. And um, in the absence of any funding for a, a dedicated redesign that creates more footpath width and, and opens up better lines of sight, I think we're 
really going to have to urgently invest in in more funding for some of those cross suburb links so that it's easier for cyclists to travel east west through kangaroo point and south brisbane rather than having to travel all the way around the riverside path of the peninsula thanks thank you councillor shree is there any further debate i see no hands council murphy yeah, thanks very much, uh, Deputy Chair. Just in responding very briefly to uh, Councillor Sri's comments, we did have a, a more broader, wide-ranging discussion on uh, this petition uh, outcome at the committee meeting uh, where I did state, and I'll restate it now for the record, that uh, Council is committed to upgrading uh, this section of uh, bikeway prior to the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge coming online. Uh, it's envisaged that, that that bridge will be operational in this term of council. So um, we're certainly not talking about kicking this into the long grass uh, or, or delaying this one indefinitely. Uh, we have acknowledged that uh, the pedestrian conflict issues that exist along that river walk uh, section of bikeway are significant. Um, they are uh, indeed uh, dangerous in some parts. And so uh, we do want to resolve those issues. We are committed to resolving those issues uh, until such a time as we've uh, finalised a detailed reference design uh, for the bridge. It would probably be fruitless for us to go ahead and, and come up with a detailed design of how we would address those issues on uh, the river walk that connects right in with that bridge. So I think it's, it's prudent here for us to just uh, allow that bridge to progress a little bit further along in its design phase and then for us to come out with uh, the plan for, uh, I guess, what you would term the, the immediate uh, tie-in bikeways to that bridge, and this would be one of them. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour, raise your hand and say aye. 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 And those against? The ayes have it. Uh, Councillor McLaughlin, please. Hi, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 2nd of June 2020, be adopted. Seconded. So that was Councillor Maddock, thank you. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Maddock, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 2nd of June 2020, be adopted. Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, in committee last week, uh, we had an interesting presentation on what's at the, uh, the business end of the infrastructure portfolio. That's dealing with contributed assets, which uh, many councillors here being talked about, but may not be aware fully of the process that uh, we go through for accepting contributed assets, either from uh, developers or from other government entities. So that was why we asked the manager of asset management at the manager of asset management to come in and to talk about that process. Um, it's uh, probably not one of the, the 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 glory end of the work, but it's a uh, very important work to make sure that uh, the assets that uh, come onto the council books are understood and have the, have the uh, potential to be properly maintained. So council does attend to those contributed assets from whichever party provides them to make sure that they're of good quality, that they're achieving a required standard, uh, and more importantly, that we have sufficient information to register the assets and to achieve management standards. So that's the process for accepting contributed assets uh, and a great presentation. I recommend the report to all councillors uh, who may be unfamiliar with that process to, to read it and to understand it. Uh, we also had, Mr Deputy Chair, three petitions um, relating in the main to traffic management uh, requests. I'll leave that to uh, any councillors who want to participate in the debate. Thank you, Councillor Gocklin. Is there any further debate? I see no hands being raised. Councillor McLaughlin? No more. Uh, we'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. And raise your hand, sorry. Aye. Aye. Those against? Believe the ayes have it. Councillor Cunningham, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 2nd of June, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Davies, that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting 
dated Tuesday the 2nd of June 2020 be adopted? Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Deputy Chair. Before I move on to the presentation from last week, I had two questions that I took on notice during committee that I'd like to be able to answer now. Through you, Chair, Councillor Griffiths asked for the stats on the fire pit trial. In the first week of June 2019, Council received 17 compliance cases for backyard burning and, ex and excessive smoke. This is compared to 15 compliance cases in the first week of June this year. We've had 49 pieces of correspondence, 48 against and one in support. But there is also a live e-petition with council that has over 1600 signatures in support of lifting the ban and an e-petition with 26 signatures to ban fire pits. Councillor Cassidy also asked about the dispute process for fire pit compliance. If a person receives a fine for backyard burning, they can access council's stage uh, three-stage appeal process. Council's prescribed infringement notice dispute guidelines apply to all penalty infringement notices issued, including those issued during this trial for braziers. Detailed information about the disputed infringement notice process, including information about how to lodge an appeal is on our website. Moving to the committee report, the presentation last week was on the new Boondle Wetlands Environment Centre. The other item in the meeting for information was the Bushland Preservation Levy Report for the period ending March 2020. I'll leave debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Is there further debate? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Deputy Chair. I um, uh, talked tonight on the uh, Boonal Wetlands Environment Centre. Uh, in the late 1980s, all of this could have been lost uh, to the north side of Brisbane. The Atkinson Liberal Council Administration wanted to turn uh, what is now the Boonal Wetlands uh, into an Olympic Games venue, Athletes Village, and then ultimately Canal Estates. Uh, those plans were still very much on the table right into the early 1990s, right up until there were some very visionary political leaders who took a stand and did something that would change the north side forever. Jim Sawley as Lord Mayor, uh, Denise Herbert as the councillor for the Deegan Ward, and Wayne Swan as the federal member for Lilly, brokered a deal for council to purchase the first 500 hectares of the Burnell wetlands for just $1. The decision was preceded, of course, by uh, a significant public campaign uh, led by people like Laurie and Margaret Jays, Brian and Ros Hutchison and Ken McEwen. At the opening of the new Burnell Wetlands Environment Centre Centre earlier this year uh, brought those achievements together. Uh, it was wonderful to be there and attend that uh, ceremony with Brian and Roz, um, with Margaret Jays, uh, and with uh, many other members of the community um, who were there uh, witness to that. We're also joined by Turrible Elder Uncle Des Sandy and Derek Sandy from the Yorong Pan Dancers, who were able to provide a um, connection to the ancient um, and to the modern as well with the new centre. Uh, so this was a thoroughly um, good project and I just want to congratulate everyone involved. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Is there any further debate? Sorry, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Griffiths Beach here. Councillor Griffiths. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, look, I'd just like to speak in relation to the Bushland um, Preservation Levy Report of uh, March 2020. Um, I was quite astounded to hear earlier in the meeting uh, a councillor attack uh, the state government with relation to how they are spending money across the state. And uh, it was more that the, the point was, or the reference or inference was, that they were misusing public money uh, to spend in AOP electorates. Um, and I, I find this most astounding because that's the very point uh, that we have been making for some time in relation to this LMP administration and the decisions they've been making in relation to the bushland funding. And um, if you look at this, uh, this quarter's report, it just reinforces that. So in this, uh, in this report, we see $7.5 million being spent on Roadie Road at Stafford Heights, an LMP electorate, and, and there was a good LMP campaign about this particular bushland. Uh, once again, $1.3 million at Wakeley, another LMP electorate. $5.6 million for Polara, which uh, was at that time in my electorate, but actually was going into an LMP electorate when the announcement was made. 
$1.2 million for Sunnybank Hills, which is an LMP electorate for various properties, $1.4 million for Carrawatha, once again in an LMP electorate, and $99,000 uh, yeah, for um, uh, Bracken Ridge. So all that expenditure, all that expenditure was going into to purchase properties that were in LMP electorates or that would be in LMP electorates. And I just know from working with Oxleys, uh, working with residents at Oxley and Tarragindi and Nathan and right across the city, I know I've worked with Councillor Johnson with the residents at Oxley, um, we have tried time and again to get worthwhile uh, bushland that should be preserved, that should be added to the city's heritage, um, uh, added in our electorates, in ALP electorates, in green or independent electorates. I'm really concerned um, that we have here a black and white report that shows this consistent rotting of the system. Uh, and it's disappointing that um, it's really disappointing that this is seen as this is the way business is done. You know, and disappointingly, it was Councillor Adams who, who made these accusations and uh, already she's had $6.2 million spent on the land at Upper Mount Cravat where the land was totally cleared of vegetation, that it was three house blocks with a few houses on tennis court and cocos palms. And yet in this budget report, we're seeing another $102,000 being spent on that land. There is land right across our city um, that needs to be purchased. There is land at Tarragindi and Nathan that actually has koalas on it and has mature trees on it. <laughs> and that could be a great asset for our city that this administration is not doing anything about. So I think um, and I believe and I will keep calling for, as long as I'm in opposition, calling for better use of this public money because this is public money, not LMP money, and this is money that should be benefiting all residents of Brisbane. And it is my firm belief that these uh, acquisitions and the decisions about which properties should be bought should be done independent of this council administration by uh, a body that can make decisions independent of um, the political process so that it is fairly distributed uh, and that we are acquiring the best bushland that we can with residents' money. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, further debate? There be no hands rising. Uh, we'll put the resolution. Oh, sorry, Councillor Cunningham, response. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. It seems like a long tradition in this place to use bushland levy as a soapbox, which is, which is a bit disappointing. Um, but look, what can I say in response to Councillor Griffiths? We've been over this a number of times. Bushland is purchased using a criterion to assess. They are value for money, ecological corridor, consolidating natural areas, threatened ecosystems, threatened species, management issues, and habitat restoration. Oh, that get there then. A and it's in LMP wards. <laughs> we've, we've gone through this earlier in the meeting. Can we allow Councillor Cunningham to continue uninterrupted, please? That's the, last well, time, that's the last time I'll say please. Councillor Cunningham, please continue. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. And uh, through you, Mr Deputy Chair, to Councillor Griffiths, I'm happy to work with you on um, trying to convince your state Labor colleagues to, uh, to give us the land at Tui Forest so that that land can be protected for the future. So I hope, uh, I hope to get your support with that. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Mr Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Now put the resolution. All those in favour, raise your hand, please. Say aye. 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 Those against, the ayes have it. We move on to field services. Oh, oh sorry, my mistake. Uh, City Standards, Community Health and Safety Committee, Councillor Marks. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 2nd of June, 2020, be adopted. Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Howard, thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Mark, seconded by Councillor Howard, that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 2nd of June, 2020, be adopted. Councillor Marks. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, Deputy Chair. Look, as the Chair, we do have the capacity to go around the world before we do our report. Well, I don't intend to actually go around the world, just across the water. I just want to say um, hello to my some of my family who are actually tuned in from New Zealand watching tonight. They are um, officially COVID-free New Zealand as the first country in the world, and so therefore all restrictions have been lifted and Therefore, some of my family are now able to um, get together for the very first time um, to, to see each other again. So in particular, say hello to my mother-in-law, Rita. So the committee presentation last week was the Brisbane Botanic Gardens Wedding Lawn and Sculpture Projects for 2020, and we had three petitions, which I'm happy to leave debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Marks. Is there further debate? Councillor Johnston, please. Uh, yes, just briefly, I'd like to speak on item C and D, and I'd ask that item C is taken seriatim for voting purposes. Um, just briefly on item uh, D, um, certainly I support the um, residents' requests in Chelmar to remove this tree that's been butchered by Energex uh, in uh, Richmond Street, Chelmar. Um, but as I did in committee, I just want to put on the record my concern about the inconsistent approach that council takes uh, to tree removal. Um, you know, for many years I've sat on this committee and I've watched significantly um, concerning trees that residents want to have removed um, that, are, that won't be removed by council. In this case, there's pruning um, that has allegedly damaged the structure of the tree. The first three times that council assessed it, uh, you know, it wasn't damaged, but the fourth time it was. Um, I just find that even though we changed the rules around why trees could be removed um, to include uh, damage to people and property a few years ago, council remains reluctant to address problem tree issues when residents raise them. And the lack of consistency is a real issue that I've observed. And over many years, I've observed um, tree issues in Councillor Strunk's ward um, be ignored um, and tree issues in my own ward um, that have been ignored. So this is a good outcome for uh, the Chilmer Street residents. And I just urge Council to be um, proactive uh, about how it undertakes um, assessment um, because there are numerous trees um, that reasonably, I think, could be removed and replaced with a more suitable species, and council's just refusing, uh, you know, to do so. Um, so, uh, just uh, with respect to item C, um, this was a petition uh, response that uh, was really interesting. We had 52 people uh, sign a petition calling for smoking to be banned uh, through different areas in the CBD. Um, one of the really interesting things about committee last week when this was considered is that there are only two members of that committee who had any idea about what's happened um, historically with respect to these issues with smoking, uh, and that was Councillor Cumming and myself, and that's no disrespect to Councillor Marks, um, who has been here a few years, or the other councillors who are brand shiny and new, um, but there was a feeling that council could not uh, do anything with respect to um, uh, with respect to smoking in certain areas. However, council does have some power with respect to banning uh, smoking, and we have done so uh, in certain areas of uh, the mall. And it is extremely disappointing uh, that council uh, would not consider any further changes in other key uh, pedestrian parts of uh, the CBD. And I think it's quite disappointing um, that, this, again, the council's trying to blame the state Labor government when clearly we have power uh, to take action with respect uh, to uh, smoking. Um, and I just say to council that this is a very disappointing uh, response. It absolutely does not address the petitioner's concerns. Uh, I did not support it when it came to uh, committee. Uh, and I uh, do not support it now. So I certainly hope there'll be a seconder. Um, I think it would be a good thing to ban smoking in very busy pedestrian areas of the city. Um, in certain locations where people congregate, um, it would make uh, the city a much, uh, a much better place uh, for residents. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Is there any further debate? No further debate. Uh, Councillor Marks. 
please. Oh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Yes, uh, as Councillor Johnson mentioned on item C regarding, sorry, D regarding the uh, replacement, remove and replacement of the cassia tree at 69 Richmond Street, Chelmer. Um, it was a tree that was um, pruned under the um, power lines from the energetic scenario that was happening that you um, actually yourself brought up, Deputy Chair, um, some time ago that there was an issue that uh, issue has since been addressed with Energex. Um, but unfortunately, as a result of that, this tree has had to be removed. Um, and I think that the, um, the, the photo of the tree quite clearly shows the damage that it was done to it. But, you know, basically every tree is assessed on its merit by arborists. Um, and um, that's the opinion that we take on board as the council officers. So uh, thank you for everyone for the debate. Thank you, Council Marks. We'll now put items A, B and D. All those in favour, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Against. The ayes have it. We'll now put item C. All those in favour, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Those against? No. The ayes have it. Well, now Division. There being no seconded, we'll move on. Uh, Councillor Howard, please. Community Arts Nighttime Economy Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the meeting of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee held on the 2nd of June 2020 be adopted. Seconded. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Howard and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee dated Tuesday the 2nd of June 2020 be adopted. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. We had an interesting presentation about community halls and hireable spaces and we also had one petition that was considered by the committee last week and I will um, leave the debate to the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Is there any further debate? There being no hands, Councillor Howard? No, all good. All good. We'll put the resolution. All those in favour of the report, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Those against? I believe the ayes have it. Right, we move on to finance. Councillor Allen, please. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 2nd of June 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen and seconded by Councillor Huang that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee right. meeting dated the 2nd of June 2020 be adopted. Councillor Allen. Uh, point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chairman. Just a procedural matter. I'm just wondering why a petition about a car park in the Wyndham Community Centre um, is in the Finance and Administration uh, Committee. Um, I'm not sure why it wouldn't either be in um, uh, city standards under asset services or under... Um, uh, the Lifestyle Committee. I'm just seeking some clarity about why it's appeared in this committee. Uh, Mr Chair, I think I can potentially answer that for you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Uh, Councillor Johnston, the car park is on council land. So it's part of the uh, asset optimisation portfolio. There we go. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Councillor um, Allen, please continue. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Just quickly, we had a committee presentation on the first home by uh, first homeowners remission scheme, very popular scheme. And in addition to that, there was the petition uh, requesting council not build a bitumen car park in the grounds of the Wynnum Community Centre. I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Is there any further debate? Councillor Cunningham. Uh, sorry, Councillor Cumming. My apologies. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'd ask that uh, item B be dealt with seriatim for voting purposes. Um, seriatim, yes. And in relation to item B, uh, this is a matter that we're, uh, it's a considerable importance to me. Um, uh, local residents have said to me for many years that uh, the, one of the reasons they don't shop in Wynnum Central is there's a shortage of parking. If I had a dollar for every time that has been said to me, I'd be a wealthy man. Uh, currently, the only public car park directly owned by the Brisbane City Council is the Wynnum Community Centre car park, uh, which is mainly on the front edge of Charlotte Street, Wynnum, uh, which is close to the Wynnum Central CBD. 
Uh, I see this car park as a community resource and would like to see it treated as a public car park for the whole of Wyndham Central, not just the community centre. Uh, the problem is the council's about to resurface the car park. I have no problem with the bitumen, but council's committed to a layout for the car park, which will slash the current uh, capacity, which allows uh, anything from 75 to 100 cars to be parked in the area, down to 31 cars. This is an area of land which I measured, actually. It's uh, 37.6 metres in depth, 52.8 metres wide, so it's uh, 1,985 uh, square metres in area. If you divide that through by 31, they're actually allowing 64 square metres for every car park, uh, and uh, I think that's uh, that's excessive. Uh, the problem with Wyndham Central is that it's uh, it's not the problem. One of the benefits is that it's an area eight storeys under the Wyndham Manly Neighbourhood Plan, and uh, parking is likely to get more difficult and congested in Wyndham Central as time goes on, uh, and uh, the uh, as the, the amount of parking required by council of developers is usually not adequate enough to stop a lot of uh, unit occupiers parking on the street. Also, the soon-to-be-completed uh, cinema in Wynnum is only a street away, and cinema patrons will be looking for a park as well. Uh, I uh, have seen in other councils around South East Queensland and Redcliffe, there's uh, a council car parks near most of their com uh, commercial and retail suburbs along the uh, Esplanade in Redcliffe, and something like this would be great in Wynnum Manly. So this is a chance for the council to markedly improve the uh, viability of Wynnum Central, an area which continues to struggle financially. There are around about 30 empty shops uh, before the coronavirus lockdown in Wynnum Central. So uh, this could be uh, uh, retained as a car park with a lot greater capacity and uh, people encouraged to, uh, to park in the car park uh, and use some of the area for uh, uh, property owners, business owners and employees, walk a street or, or two to uh, work and uh, also uh, that would leave other car parking near the, near the shops available for customers. So I'd like to see Council change its view in relation to this matter and uh, it wouldn't be any big back down or anything like that, but it would be a great benefit to the community and I would be uh, very complimentary of the Council if they did that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cumming. Is there any further debate? There being no hands on our put item A. Uh, all those in favour of item A, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Those who say no, leave the ayes have it. We'll now do item B. All those in favour, raise your hand and say aye. 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 And those against? Aye. No, the eyes have it. Thank you. Division. Uh, we've got division call by Councillor Cumming, and I believe it's been seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Yep. Uh, can you ring the bells, please? Is that enough? All right, we'll now put item B. All those in favour, raise your hand, say aye, and hold it there, please. Aye. Aye. Yeah, this must be a close vote. <laughs> we only see the top of your head, Councillor Cumming. You've got to move closer to the camera. There we go. Mm, right. We're, we're good. We're good with the eyes. Can we have the nose, please? No. No. Oh, I think Councillor Griffiths is definitely a no. <laughs> 
<laughs> sorry, your fingers keep disappearing, Councillor Griffith. Oh, sorry. There's no chance to cook. You got it? And Councillor Shrew. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to general business. Petitions. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, you read the results there, Deputy? Yes, I will. I will. I forgot. My apologies. Uh, Clark, can you please read the results? Mr Deputy Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 18 in favour and uh, five against. So the ayes have it. Uh, we'll now move on to... Uh, I've lost my place now. My apologies. Move on to petitions. Councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor Maddock. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I have two petitions, the first being a petition of residents uh, looking for improvement at Milton Park uh, for light installation and basketball hoop refurbishment. And I have a second petition uh, from residents in regards to the intersection of Gregory Street and Morley Street at Tuong. Thank you. Councillor Cumming. Yes, I have uh, some petitions uh, I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Peter Russo, MP, which seeks, uh, they seek traffic signage be installed on McCulloch and Tr Street and Troughton Road, asking heavy haulage vehicles to minimise their noise when braking in this area. Thank so, you. Thank you. Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Bizarrely, I have the same petition, which is um, to do with heavy haulage signs. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please, to accept the petitions? Mr Deputy Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, that all the petitions as presented be received and referred to committee, the committee's concern for consideration and report. All those in favour? Yep. Aye. Aye. And those against, the ayes have it. Uh, councillors, are there any statements of, uh, sorry, are there any statements required as a result of council conduct review panel order? There being no hands raised. Councillors, are there any items of general business? There being no hands raised, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you. Thank you.